Gabe, are we ready? Okay. I hereby call this session of student fees committee to order. Madam Clerk, please proceed with roll call. When I call your name, please respond with here present. Zachary James. Here. Maggie Hull. Here. Olivia Babin. Present. Red Martin. Present. Glennis Jackson. Here. John Kirk. Here. Balaji Chandra Sakarin. Here. Shilu Surrender. Here. Werner Galling. Dr. Terry Hall. Here. Gabriel Fonseca. Here. Lauren Smith. Here. Jason Post. Here. David Miller. He, he'll be here in okay. just a minute. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sydney Brown. Here. Ann Mika. Here. Mackenzie Haas. Here. We have 17 committee members in attendance, so quorum has been met. With quorum present, we will move on. We will proceed with public forum. Advisor Fonseca, has anybody re requested to speak during public forum? No. Seeing none. Uh, in compliance with the association bylaws, each member upon recognition is entitled to offer an opening statement. Are there any members wishing to present an opening statement at this time? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, we are ready to move on. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to committee regulations as set by the bylaws, each requesting entity is entitled to a total presentation not to exceed 30 minutes, with 15 minutes for the line item presentation and 15 minutes for question by the committee. Additionally, no member may interrupt the presenter during their 15-minute presentation, except for the chair. At the conclusion of each presentation, the chair shall open the floor to questions. Members must seek recognition prior to addressing the presenter. The chair reserves the right to silence a member if they speak out of turn or are not called on. Finally, the chair shall regulate the question period, ensuring that similar questions are not asked more than twice. Are there any questions? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, we're ready to proceed. Mr. Chairman, presentation number one is the Sunflower. Their request is located on page 259 and 268 of the Fees Binder. Welcome, and thank you for coming to present to us today. You will have 15 minutes to present on your line item covering the topics that you think will aid the committee in making this decision. Following that, we will have a question and answering period where we as the committee get to ask you questions about your budget. We'll begin with introductions from the committee. My name is Zachary James. I serve as the student body treasurer and the chair of the student fees committee. Hi, my name is Maggie Hall and I'm the chairwoman of the budget and finance committee. I'm Olivia Babin. I'm the speaker of the student senate. Hello, my name is Red Martin. I'm the representative for the Barton School of Business. Hi, I'm Glennis Jackson. I'm the representative for the College of Applied Studies. Hi, my name is John Kirk. I'm the representative for the College of Fine Arts. Hi, I'm Balaji Chandrasekharan. and I'm the graduate student representative. Good morning, Shilu Surrender, Director of Financial Aid. Hi, I'm Terry, Vice President for Student Affairs. I'm Gabriel Fonseca, I'm the SGA Advisor. I'm Lauren Smith with the Budget Office. Hello, Jason Post with the Budget Office. Hello, Sydney Brown, the College of Health Professions representative. I'm Ann Mwika, LS representative. Hello, oh, excuse me, my name is Mackenzie Haas. I'm the student body vice president. Hello, my name is Taylor Fox. I serve as the clerk of the student senate. And with that, you may proceed. Awesome, well, hello everyone. My name is Lindsay. I am the editor in chief of The Sunflower. And behind me is Amy DeVault. She's our faculty advisor. And we're just here to give you just a rough overview of, is my mic on? Yeah. Okay, good, <laughs> I couldn't tell. Uh, we're here to just give you just a rough overview of the Sunflower, all we are. Obviously, we can't cover everything in 
15 minutes, but I will try my absolute best. So as you are all probably aware, the Sunflower is Wichita State's student newspaper um, and the news source about that just covers all things Wichita State news about alumni, uh, students, faculty, staff, and just the surrounding community. Uh, we work to inform, and not only do we work to inform uh, the student body and the Wichita State community, but we also are an applied learning experience. Currently, there's roughly about 25 students on staff. That is actually a pretty small number compared to other years, but because of the pandemic, that's what we have. And every single staff member right now, I'm happy to say, is very involved in the Sunflower, very involved in writing, designing, um, taking photos, just everything that they want to do, they do, and it's just a great experience for them. Um, our proposed budget this year um, is, has been the same for quite some time now. Our full budget is 195000 and 145000 of that money comes from the student fees money. Um, and it's so important to note that the, the money we get from SGA is directly impactful to students. Um, out of that 145000 that we are requesting, two-thirds of that, which is 117000 goes directly towards student salaries. And the student salaries are dependent every single year, dependent on the editor-in-chief. We're completely in charge of what the student salaries look like. And that's just really important for us to have that money, you know, so um, students get paid for the work that they do and, you know, are given raises whenever, you know, they're putting in extra work. And it's just great to have that money. Um, we are ed completely editorially independent from the university, which means that we do not, we are not, um, there's not someone in the university who's basically our boss. You know, every single thing is student run. Everything that goes in the paper has been decided on by students. Uh, we edit all the stories, uh, we edit all the photos, we decide what photos go in the paper. We're completely independent and that's another reason why our applied learning experience is so important because all of our students, you know, get that chance to make those decisions and it's such a great experience for them. Um, this year's, we have different goals each year, and this, goals, this year's goals, um, we want to really make our opinion section more student-driven. Um, you know, I think it's, it's quite well known that we have a, a campus with so many students, so many different opinions, and it's hard to cover all those opinions with our opinion section, and while we try our best and we do get a lot of diverse opinions in the paper, you know, we're, we're really looking for different ways to get student voices um, in the paper, whether that means guest columns or just Students knowing that they can come to us if they have an opinion, it's just we really want to make sure that that is, especially with everything going on right now, we have a lot of opinions about the recent events, and so I think it's really important to give students that um, opportunity. We really also want to increase our audience engagement. Um, I think we have really tried this year, especially on our Instagram, our social media, to really get students involved, and we've seen a very positive atmosphere when it comes to our Instagram, our Facebook, and our Twitter of just students responding to, you know, our articles with, you know, their comments and, you know, involving themselves in maybe it's polls, maybe it's um, just reacting to our Instagram stories. It's, we found a really awesome um, atmosphere on there, and so we're really working on keeping that up and finding different ways. Um, we also want to focus this year on visual journalism, and that's something else I wanted to talk about. This year we have really trained a lot of staff members on design. This is my first semester ever doing design, and I have really loved the experience of just learning something new that I never thought that I could do. And so that's another reason why, you know, the student newspaper is so important is because it gives students opportunities to do something that they thought that they might never get the chance to do. And so um, that's another thing that we want to focus on. And just, I just wanted to um, just talk about, you know, our successes the past year um, at the Sunflower. Um, for the third year in, the in a row, the Sunflower was named a pacemaker finalist, which is an honor basically reserved for the best of the best of college media. Uh, the Sunflower was the only college newspaper in Kansas to um, get named one of those, and so that's a really big deal, and we are just so honored by that. More than 5,000 people follow the Sunflower on Facebook, and since October 2016, we have got, gotten more than 1.5 million page views since the launch of our new website. Uh, this year, actually, um, we earned first place best of show in the National College Media Competition for our print newspaper and also our um, online website, which is the first time we've ever done that, so that was also super cool. Uh, last year's editor-in-chief earned fifth place in the National Ernie Col Kyle, oh, sorry, Pyle College Reporter of the Year competition. Uh, five staff members placed in highly competitive national competitions for individual work, and the Sunflower added 1,000 followers on its Facebook page over the last year. 
And if you're just really wanting just a rough view over our budget and kind of what we use our student fees money for, this little handout is in your folder, so if you just wanna give that a look over if you have any budget questions, I've learned this really answers a lot of questions. So um, I think that's all that I have, unless Amy wants to add something. I do not, I'm really just here in case there's any questions that you need some help with. Awesome. Are there any questions at this time? Chairperson Hall. So I'm looking at your breakdown of pay for your students, um, and I did notice that you added a podcast director, which, amazing idea, I love a good podcast. Um, but I was just wondering, how did you reprioritize in order to add this position to um, your um, staff? Yeah, so um, probably I think last spring, um, we started a podcast just because we had a staff member who's really interested in that. And they started a podcast and she, no one was really the podcast director, no one really had that title. And so uh, when we found out that she wanted to continue it uh, last semester, um, we just decided to add that position. You know, we, we had the money. I think that's also so great about the money we get from student fees is we have that flexibility to create new positions if needed and give, you know, be able to pay people for their work because we didn't want to have her as the director, but not really the director, not really get paid as much as she should have. And so uh, we actually, she actually switched to opinion editor recently because that was also something that she wanted to try, um, which is another great thing about the Sunflower is there's always a chance to try new things. And so we recently got a new podcast director who is um, still kind of working on the little things of trying to get our first podcast out. And so, yeah, I think, you know, we always give um, opportunities to, um, them to step up and start trying new positions, and we just really prioritize their learning experiences. Representative Kirk. Yes, yeah, so um, one question that a lot of the uh, students that I represent are asking me is, so with your publishing and printing um, and web costs, <clears throat> it says like you're spending $32,071. Um, with, I mean, with the times coming up more and everything, has there ever been a talk of potentially maybe cutting down your um, your printing costs? Because, uh, for instance, just in like Dirksen alone, the the papers that the physical papers that are in there are hardly ever touched. So I wanted to know what you thought about that because I can't speak on the other colleges. Yeah. So um, ever since the pandemic, we actually cut down printing to once a week, mainly because we don't have a lot of people on, on campus to read our papers. And so we did cut that down due to the pandemic. Um, and I think, does that answer your question? Um, kind of that, so during the pandemic, yes, but like overall, like let's imagine the pandemic, pandemic never happened. Um, would have, would have that been a thing that we have, would have done or is that just because of the pandemic? Um, I think we actually, so we printed twice a week uh, before the pandemic, and that might have stayed that way. Um, the leftover papers that we don't use, that don't get touched, that are in the rack when we replace the papers, we do recycle. And we're actually currently, we've had talks about, you know, giving those, the extra papers to the green group to use for projects. You know, we have, have had conversations about what to use with those papers. Um, yeah, so that, does that answer your question more? Okay, beautiful. <laughs> Lindsay, I might jump in on this one just a minute. Um, the Sunflower did used to print three times a week and they did cut to two. Um, and mirroring what's happening in, in the professional um, newspaper world, it's definitely something that is on the table. Um, and I know it's hard, you know, our editors change every year so they don't sometimes have the historical context, but um, it's definitely something that has been discussed you know, whether we go down to once a week, um, but that's definitely not a decision that had been made before the pandemic. Um, I know the previous editor had started that discussion with the publication board to start looking into whether that would be the most, um, make the most sense to cut down to once a week. Um, I think the students all very much want to keep a printed paper though for as long as they can. Um, that's an additional level of experience that they get in that pressure to have to design and produce the paper, get it to the printer on time, meet those deadlines. Um, so I don't think anyone's at the point that we want to completely cut the print edition of the paper, but I think discussions going forward will definitely look at should we stay at once a week post pandemic 
or should we go back to twice a week? So how many physical copies are going out once a week? Like how many physical copies are being printed? Um, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's 5,000 across campus. Amy, does that sound correct? That's correct. Beautiful. And some off campus as well. Speaker Bevan. Um, so recently you guys have started publishing like a digital version of the paper. So like I've seen it on Facebook and stuff like that where you can kind of scroll through the paper uh, online. Have you guys looked at, because personally I don't think that you guys should cut back the amount of content that you're, you're producing, but um, maybe cutting back the number of physical papers that you guys print and then providing that um, uh, online version of the paper for people who might not want to pick up a physical one or don't get to campus or things like that. Yeah, so like we said, that's a conversation that of course we're willing to have. Um, we've actually, that's a website called Issue and we've actually always posted on there ever since I can remember, but we've been really posting the links nowadays now that you know not a lot of people are on campus and don't know that that's an option. So we've always done that. I mean, every now and then we missed a couple, but um, now that not a lot of people are on campus, we're really pushing that digital front. And of course, you know, um, that is a conversation that we're always, we're always having, you know, that's a conversation of what's gonna happen with print, you know, you know, are people even gonna read the paper? You know, what, what does that look like? Um, of course, with the ever-changing uh, front of journalism and print papers, that's always gonna be a conversation. Representative Kirk. A uh, point of clarification for myself. So right now you um, print about 5,000 copies per week, correct? Yes. So um, before, when you, before when we were doing two times a week, it was, I, I mean, I'm guessing 10,000? Yes, I assume so, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Seeing, oh, advisor Fonseca. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, your plan for updating? I know you talked about this in one of our meetings on that Monday, um, and it just made me remember when we visited last year the space itself. Mm -hmm. um, but can you, because there were some people who weren't at that uh, meeting, can you talk a little bit about your plan of utilizing your cash balance for renovations to your space? Yes, so um, because we stopped printing halfway through the semester last uh, spring, we got to save a lot of money, and with that money, we were planning to use it to remodel our newsroom. Um, our newsroom has not been redone since ever since Elliott Hall was built, and so everything is in there is original, tor original towards Elliott Hall, which means a lot of the furniture is very, like, immovable. We can't really move a lot of the furniture because it's like stuck to the ground. So there's just a lot of inconveniences when it comes to that workspace, especially now when it's our newsroom is so collaborative. Um, and especially once, you know, we get to be together more in person, it's a really collaborative space. And so right now, all the desks are like sectioned off from each other, and we have a big table that's, you can't move anywhere. So it's really hard to get around. Um, so we are planning on using uh, that money to remodel it and just make it, you know, not do anything too drastic, but you know, just get new floors because our floors are stained from all the furniture that we had to remove. And so get new floors, get new furniture, just make it a, just a better space so our work is better, so we get to collaborate more. Um, and so we've been, we've been talking about that off and on for a long time, but this year is kind of a year that we're finally just really, really pushing it and um, trying to get that done. Advisor Fonseca. I have a two-part follow-up. Uh, the first one is, is there a timeline set for that? And second, is $33,000 or whatever the cash balance is gonna cover all of the costs for it? Yeah, so the timeline is up in the air currently. Uh, we're still working on, we're planning on moving upstairs to an, a different room while they you know, paint the walls and remove the floor just, you know, so obviously we're not down there when that happens. So it's kind of up in the air for when we can get moved, that moved. I think Amy has the finances question and probably gets to talk more about the timeline because she knows more about it than I do. Uh, yeah, so we're kind of in the middle. We're, it, we're working with facilities right now to get some of that big stuff out so that we can um, then look at the space and decide what furniture to buy. So we haven't done the quote yet on the furniture. Um, so it it's possible it would run, you know, between thirty three and fifty thousand dollars for the for the total. Um, but the we between what we had in cash balances last year and what we've saved this year, 
on um, things like student travel. Our students haven't gone to any conferences, obviously, and so we've saved money there as well. So um, we feel like the 50,000 well, should cover it, and we definitely have that between the leftover from last year and what we've saved this year on both printing and the student travel. And hope we're hoping that timeline-wise, um, we're very much in the middle. We hope that by early summer it's complete, but some of that's dependent on how quickly the university will work on things like that. Speaker Babin. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Sunflower Technology Fund uh, and whether or not you guys are planning to replace computers soon, because that seems like that's what, what the cost is. Um, is that something you're planning on doing soon since your, your technology reserve has gotten fairly high? Um, just would you mind speaking a little more about that? Yeah, so we're actually currently working on um, getting new computers. Um, all, of our, all of our desktops downstairs are extremely old. They don't have, they are incapable to have the newest version of our um, design software on there, so that's kind of been a big problem with us recently. So we actually are currently working on getting those ordered, trying to figure out all we need, and hopefully by next semester we'll have new uh, desktops. So yes, we are currently working on that. Speaker Babbitt. Yes, I'll, I'll piggyback on that one. We have ordered um, half of the equipment that we need to do the refresh, and. Um, we're just waiting on finishing the quote from Apple to finish that out. So that's in the works and that the, the money from the technology fund will be down to close to zero uh, by the end of this fiscal year. So I just want to clarify on what you just said. So are you planning on spending basically, it looks like it's roughly like 23,000, 24,000. So you're planning on using all of that fund with it by the end of this fiscal year. Is that correct? correct? Okay. Yes. And just to clarify what Speaker Babin was talking about, this is something that you build up every three to four years? I think that's always what we've said, but I know um, it's been at least six years. It may be pushing seven since the last time we refreshed. We have um, ordered a few cameras on occasion in the last five years out of that fund, but we haven't refreshed any of the computers for at least six years. Are there any other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you all so much for coming to present to us. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all. Mr. Chairman, presentation number two is the Cultural Ambassador Program. Their request is located on page 272 of the Fees Binder. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, you will have 15 minutes to present on your line item covering the topics that you think the, the committee um, will need in aiding its discussion. Um, following that, we will have a question and answering period where we as the committee get to ask you questions about your budget. We will begin with introductions from the committee. My name is Zachary James. I serve as the student body treasurer and the chair of the student fees committee. Hi, my name is Maggie Hull, and I'm the chairwoman of the budget and finance committee. Hi, I'm Olivia Babin. I'm the Speaker of the Student Senate. Hello, my name is Red Martin. I'm the representative for the Barton School of Business. Hi, I'm Glennis Jackson. I'm the representative for the College of Applied Studies. 
Hi, my name is John Kirk. I'm the representative for the College of Fine Arts. Hello, I'm Balaji Chandrasekharan. I'm the graduate student representative. Hi, I'm Terry Hall. I'm the vice president for student affairs. Good morning. I'm Gabriel Fonseca. I'm the SGA advisor. Hi, Lauren Smith with the budget office. Good morning. Jason Post with the budget office. Hi. David Miller with the budget office. Hello, Sydney Brown, the College of Health Professions representative. Ann Wicca, LS representative. Hello, my name is Mackenzie Hassan, the student body vice president. Hello, my name is Taylor Fox. I serve as the clerk of the student senate. And with that, you may proceed with your presentation. Middle one. Okay. Good morning, all. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to present our request. And uh, I'm Fai Tai, the associate director of finance and marketing from international education. And today joining me on Zoom should be uh, my colleague, Jessa Roberts, and also Jing Di Zhang. And our funding request today, is, how did the other presenters do this? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> so um, I'm presenting our funding request for a cultural ambassador program, um, or number 101930. The group of cultural ambassadors, they, they are all international students coming from eight different countries. Each one of them must meet the GPA requirement of 3.0, and they must complete 20 hours of cultural outreach and also 10 hours of community service in each semester. For each cultural ambassador, they can only stay in the program for a maximum of two academic years. Um, just for your reference, I myself was a cultural ambassador 15 or 16 years ago. I stayed in the program for four years, and that's the reason that I got, I mean, uh, we started this rule, or they started the rule to um, not allow me to, you know, hold the position for too long. And currently, our eight uh, ambassadors, they come from Guatemala, Brazil, Paraguay, Ethiopia, Iran, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and also Bangladesh. Over the past five years, all our ambassadors came from 20 different countries. I'm not sure if you are aware that all of, oh, sorry, WSU international students come from more than 100 different countries. And it took us five years to only take five, one fifth of the representing countries. And our international student population represents more than 10% of uh, WSU student population. So our mission and purpose are to bring awareness of diversity and cultural cross-cultural issues to the Wichita, well, to the campus and also Wichita community. We want to broaden the perspective of students and the community to get them a worldview. Given that mission and purpose, we have three goals. The first goal. We want to perform cultural activities, cultural outreach activities to the campus and also to the Wichita community. And most commonly done is to give presentation, cultural presentation. So here on campus, what we do, um, we give presentation to academic classes such as four cultures and popular media class and the first year seminar. We also gave cultural presentation to local high schools and middle schools. We also provide trainings to um, staff members here on campus. A um, few years back, we did um, training to academic advisors at the business, business school. And we also provide training every year to housing the, R, the, the new RAs and also uh, human resources and student health. And we also do different kinds of campus events. One of the most popular ones is called the Akarima Workshop. Akarima is America's spouse backward. It is an exercise that simulates international students' experience, uh, starting from them collecting information about uh, schools in the US, and then they prepare all kinds of paperwork, uh, get their co uh, currency exchange, and then prepare all the documents, pass their English tests, 
get the visa to the US, and finally arrive the US. So in each, we did this every year, and the photo here, we did it in fall 2019, and the photos you can see from um, the folks from academic affairs and also undergrad admissions. And um, we did Global Zumba Nights, great turnout, and this is also one that students really enjoy. It's the Global Trivia Nights. Our second goal is to perform um, community service. So the Wuzbek event is one that we did quite often. And the other, this is actually my favorite. We paint map, world map, for campus, um, for some campuses. And if I remember correctly, this one we did for East High. And the third goal, well, especially during the pandemic, there's not much that we can do, so we have to be creative. And obviously, we did social media, um, we make Facebook posts every week to show, to give some cultural tips and cultural differences. And we also make video series. Um, so I, um, last year, the series we did is to make a video <coughs> series called As an International Shocker. And um, we make four different episodes and to show the different sounds or different voices. So examples, one of the episodes, we use different languages to say the greeting, or um, in different cultures, we make the sound of um, machines or cars or trains in a different way. And um, this one for animal sounds, I don't know if we can play this. Is it possible? This is, uh, all these episodes are just like two minutes or one minute. Okay, okay, so I hope, I, I hope you can um, watch it and enjoy it. And so in the past two, uh, last month, there's International Mother Tongue Day. So we also created a Spotify playlist to compile songs from different cultures. Um, and at first I, well, obviously I'm not that young like the students anymore. So I question like, if I don't know what they're singing, um, how, would they, how would they feel? But surprisingly, I enjoy it a lot more than I thought I would. So if you're interested, you can look it up. Um, the playlist is called Mother Tongue Day and uh, on Spotify. For our service brought a lot of benefits to different people. So we try to keep track of the record, and our cultural outreach in FY 2020 provide benefits to more than 200 different people, and our community service provide uh, benefits to around 350 people. So this is the quantitative perspective, and um, you should have received a handout that uh, I sent earlier. That is the qualitative perspective. So um, I think culture is more, we should look at it more qualitatively than quantitatively. So I won't, I don't plan on going through all the, uh, reading all of the feedback, but what this is, is um, the feedback from the first year seminar students. The class is taught by Dr. Carolyn Shaw. She gave an assignment to each student asking them to interview and assigned cultural ambassadors, so one out of the eight. And based on the interview, each student, they must write a paper and also share the experience in class. So with the permission of a few students, Dr. Shaw uh, shared this feedback. Um, like I said, I'm not gonna read all these. You can take your time and read. But one thing that I wanna highlight is that almost everyone would say that it opens my eyes. Um, the world is so much bigger than I thought it is. So this is our goal, and we're happy to see that the students give this feedback. So um, I hope you can take some time and read it. Now let's talk money. What we are asking for is $10,000 that will support eight of our ambassadors. In other words, each ambassador will receive $625 each semester or $1,250 per uh, academic year. And I also want to give you more perspective about international students' financial burden. Unlike American students, they are under a lot of different restrictions. Well, um, they are paying out of state. To you, you, it may sound like, well, our out of state st students, they are paying out of state tuition too. But what's the difference for international students? First of all, 
they are not eligible for federal financial aid, and also they are under a lot of work restrictions. Most international students are allowed to only work on campus un unless they go through, well, they have to attend a school for a certain time, and they have to go through um, application process to be allowed to work off campus. Regardless, they are allowed to work a maximum of 20 hours a week anyway. Also, all international students uh, have to pay a mandatory insurance of $940 per semester, and if they want to stay for summer, they have to pay about $4,400 uh, in summer. So that's around two, more than $2,000 a year extra. So on average, about $200 uh, every day, I mean every month. And I also want to bring a broader perspective to you to compare the living standard across different countries. So on the top seven, uh, sorry, those bars on top eight bars, they are the real GDP per capita of each country that our current cultural ambassadors represent, from as low as $2,000 to Thailand, that is the highest, 18000 And America, the bar is so much longer, 62. Some of you may say, wait, five. I am not making 62,000 a year, okay? So just remember, this is real GDP per capita. And the calculation is based on the whole country's economic output, divided by the population of the country, the number of people. So if you think about how much the people who are making in California or in New York, and um, here in the Midwest, we're, we're, we're not making as much. So it will probably make sense to you that this is just an average, but still, even if you think this number is higher, that means all the other countries are higher. So the perspective is America is making a lot of money. And I hope you can understand the international students' financial burden coming to study here in America. Um, so I hope we still have a little time if we have three minutes. Do we? Perfect. So uh, for my present, okay. So if you would be uh, willing to, I would like to give you a little bit of experience of our global trivia. Uh, all right, there's only three questions, and I actually brought prices. All right, not a bribe, these are not expensive stuff, don't worry. <laughs> all right, <laughs> all right, so the first one. Which of the following countries represents the top three international student population at Wichita State in FY 2021? Malaysia, Nigeria, Paraguay, and Vietnam. Anyone? Yes. Nigeria. Yes. Nigeria. Yes. Uh, Malaysia. Yes. All right. So, well, thank you. All right, so yes, so our top country is actually um, India, no surprise. And then the second one is Saudi Arabia. And the third one is Malaysia. All right, the next one. McDonald's Happy Meal was first created in which country? Brazil, Guatemala, India, or Japan? Yes. E, Japan. E. Ah. Anyone? Oh, did I? Where? Uh, Brazil. E. Yes. India. <laughs> so no one gets this. It's actually Guatemala. It was first introduced in 1977. All right, so next question. Now you see the long name in uh, italic. It's actually a city's name. And what city is it? Only three answers, all right? Bangladesh, uh, sorry, uh, Bangkok from Thailand, or Colombo in Sri Lanka, Dhaka in Bangladesh. Uh, yes. Bangkok? You got it. All right, so um, I think this one. So I hope you enjoy this little cultural experience. And now I would um, love to take any questions. And also my colleagues online uh, would love to take any questions from you. Yes. 
I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what exactly the cultural outreach that your ambassadors are required to do is. It's actually very um, open. So most of the time, like I said, we receive requests from different schools, high schools, middle schools, and also here on campus, different professors would ask our students to do. So I would say that that's the most time that our students um, spent, but um, other ones, well, what I've just done is also kind of cultural outreach in a way. Yeah, yes. Representative Kirk. Yeah, so how exactly um, do we go through the process um, in getting in touch with the different countries? I know that you said uh, there are a certain amount of countries right now that we interact with that come to us, um, but how exactly do you go through that process? Oh, that's a great question. So, for example, uh, now that out of the eight students, actually we're having four of them graduating in, um, in summer, in, in May. So we will start uh, opening the application process for any international students to apply. They have to write an essay, they have to prepare a, a cultural presentation during the interview. And of course, like I said, we ha they have to meet the requirement of 3.0 GPA. And after the interview, the three of us, so me, uh, Jessa, and Jingdi, we uh, pick the good ones that we believe they will be. And um, one rule for us, major rule, is that we cannot choose two students from the same country. We must choose them from different countries. So sometimes we get like two um, students from India. We really like them, but we cannot pick both of them. So that's, that's how we choose them. Speaker Babin. Would you mind talking a little bit more about how kind of these presentations and things that you are presenting to students impacts like the entire student body and, and the domestic student experience? Well, I wish I, um, I have the ambassadors here to tell you because it's quite different when you, what I can do is probably use my own personal cultural ambassador experience in the past. And we did a lot during my days. We went to schools, we even went to the zoo, we went to the library, so a public library to give presentation. And in most cases in the past without the pandemic, we can have a lot of interaction. We always brought artifacts to show the people. And then, um, but we, we've even done like cooking demonstration to show them how to do things and then they get a taste. So we believe that through some interactions, they can get a lot more. But a lot of times in the cultural classes, we would be given some guidelines by the teacher or the professors. Like for example, high school's professors, sometimes they, they will be like, okay, we are teaching about Africa. So we want a student from Africa. But it's interesting that most people probably didn't realize that Morocco is actually an African country. So, and it happened that the Moroccan student is just there. Um, so that's one way that we provide our um, presentation and also inside the presentation, um, a lot of basic elements that we would include. For example, um, we always talk about the flag. So just like the trivia that I also put the flags there to represent the country. And sometimes they talk about language, but um, we can't give a lot. We wish to t talk a lot. And there are other uh, ways of presentation is that some, um, for example, like um, uh, here, uh, student health, they want to n understand different um, the, the medical system in different cultures. So we have a panel of students who would attend and give them different perspectives from their own cu uh, culture and country. And that also, it is topical, but it's broader in terms of culture. Are there any other questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you so much for coming out to present to us today. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.
Mr. Chairman, presentation number three is the student conduct and community standards. Their request is located on page 277 of the fees binder. Welcome, and thank you for coming to present to us today. You will have 15 minutes to present on your line item covering the topics that you think will aid the committee in making this decision. Following that, we will have a question and answering period where we as the committee get to ask you questions about your budget. We will begin with introductions from the committee. My name is Zachary James. I serve as the student body treasurer and the chair of the student fees committee. Hi, Scott. My name is Maggie Hull, and I am the chairwoman of the budget and finance committee. Hi, I'm Olivia Babin. I am the speaker of the student senate. Hi, my name is Red Martin. I'm the representative for the Barton School of Business. Hi, I'm Glennis Jackson, and I'm the representative for the College of Applied Studies. Hey, Scott. I'm John Kirk. I'm the representative for the College of Fine Arts. Hi, I'm Balaji Chandrasekhar, and I'm the graduate student representative. Shibu Surrender, director of financial aid. Terry Hall, vice president for student affairs. Uh, Gabriel Fonseca, SGA advisor. Lauren Smith with the budget office. Hi, Scott. David Miller from the budget office. Hello, Sydney Brown, College of Health Professions representative. Anne Mwika, LAS representative. Hello, my name is Mackenzie Haas. I'm the student body vice president. Hello, my name is Taylor Fox. I serve as the clerk of the student senate. And with that, you may begin. I just want to start off by saying thank you to all of you for your hours of dedication to getting through this. I know you all have to ask hard questions um, and make difficult decisions, and so, um, I know there's hours that go into this, and so I just want to start off by saying thank you for that. Um, my name is Scott Jensen. I serve as the Associate Dean of Students here at Wichita State University. I've been in that role for about two and a half years. Um, the reason I share that is before that, I, I, I still oversee housing, but I came in as the Director of Housing. And about two and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to start working with the Student Conduct and Community Standards Office. Um, and at that time, I will tell you, I didn't, I, I hate to admit this in front of my boss's boss sitting on my left, I didn't have a full understanding of what that office did in totality. And in the last two and a half years, I've grown a great appreciation for all the work that that office does. Um, and uh, so it, it's helpful um, now, I, I know I come much more informed than I have in years past. And so I just say that a little bit humble in front of you because um, I believe the Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards, um, while often it only looks like they're there to hold students accountable when they're in trouble here on campus, um, in the last, this is our third year now of running the academic integrity um, process here on campus. And, and in that role really, that our office serves as the student's advocate throughout that whole process. And so, for those of you who are not aware sort of what that process is, is um, prior to three years ago, when a student was accused of cheating or um, wrongdoing in a class, they would be assigned a sanction by the faculty member, and that was that. There was no due process for them to appeal that process. And so faculty said, this doesn't seem right. Um, we need to create a process where students can say, you know what, I, I, I wasn't cheating. Um, and they created a process, and, and it's a good process, and we've, we've fixed it a little bit over the last couple of years you know, to make it a little smoother for both the students and the committee. Um, but what that's afforded is the ability for students to say, you know what, I, I think there was a misunderstanding of what happened here. And um, they go before a committee of both students and faculty members and are able to talk about that experience. And I will tell you that um, being afforded that due process has allowed a lot of students to indeed not be held accountable for cheating that they didn't do. And so, um, and some have been held accountable and, and I think it's a greater learning experience having to talk through that in front of peers as well as other faculty members. So um, the reason I bring up that process is it is labor intensive. And again, there's a lot of you sitting around this table and, and you think about scheduling this group, this would be way harder than a a faculty um, committee. 
But our office um, creates all of the information for the Academic Integrity Committee. They send it out. They schedule those meetings with three faculty members and two students and try and we hope to get that many. Um, we have the ability to do two faculty and one student. Um, but we bring that group together, um, process, work through and coordinate that process and, and give that student a good opportunity to have, have their day. Um, in court is the wrong term, but you, you follow where I'm going. They have, their, they have the ability to, to share their, their side. Um, they also work with the faculty member who submitted that. And so all of those folks come together. And I guess the reason I share that is um, to share just one, one piece of what this office does and what the funding from SGA goes to in terms of advocating for students and supporting students. I lead with that because that is, I would say, the more advocate, the advocating side of what our office does. Um, but I would say holding students accountable um, for conduct that is detrimental to the community is also important as well. And so when students do things um, on campus, in the residence halls, other places that do take away from other students' experiences, our office's ability to hold them accountable and hopefully be part of the educational process for them, talk about their decision making and what they're learning through, the, through their experiences here at WSU, also makes them a better student. Um, we do track um, how often we have students go through the process more than once, and our goal is that it's zero, or, you know, that we have no one go through more than once, that our conversation with them has been impactful and that they're making better decisions moving forward. So in terms of the conduct side, we do view that as a really important educational component of what we do um, at WSU as a whole. Um, just running through the budget request, as you have in front of you, um, you can see that almost the entirety of our of our request is for personnel, and so um, I have it right here in front of me, but of the $120,000 that our office requests from SGA, 90,000 of that is for personnel. And so that's for the, you know, salary and, and benefits. The other, the other money actually, part of it does go towards personnel. And so in the lower part, there is actually a line item for a graduate student. And our, our hope is to continue to work with um, the new higher education um, and student affairs graduate program that we have on campus and employ a graduate student in our office. Um, we were not able to hire one this year, but we, we, we were um, thankful to have someone who is in the program who is serving as an intern both last semester and now in a paid internship program or a position this semester. And so that's been really helpful in terms of just the, the high level of of caseload again that our office sees um, year in and year out. And so the other pieces in the lower part of our of our proposal really go towards just the day-to-day -day office stuff, um, copy machine, um, you know, office supplies, and then there is some money in there for professional development um, to keep our staff um, up to date on the latest legal issues within student conduct as well as just best practices. Um, to make sure our office is running smoothly. I think with that, I'll open it up to questions. Are there any questions for the presenter at the time? Speaker Babin. Uh, yeah, on your on the website for student conduct, it lists that there's uh, another person who works in your office, the coordinator of student conduct. Uh, is that position just not funded through student fees? Correct, that's a GU funded position. Are there any other questions for the presenter at this time? Representative Kirk. I apologize if you said this already. I just missed it. Um, with, uh, with the process going through this, um, you bring the student in, you will talk to them. What, um, what, are the, what is the process after the student like regularly comes back 20, 30 times or something like that? You know, I, I would hope we wouldn't see them more than two or three times. Um, but th the conduct process in general would go as follows, is we, we call in folks, um, if they're found responsible for a violation, they may be assigned um, a sanction. As they come in a second or third time, especially if it's a similar um, offense um, and they're found responsible, then that elevates each time from maybe what would, what would start as a warning, the next might be probation, and then the next, we might look at dismissal, dismissal um, 
from the university. So it does escalate. It's, it's similar to, you know, at a job, if you're, you know, we're not going to kick someone out the first time you do something wrong, just like you're not going to get fired the first time you make a mistake. Again, we're hoping they're learning from it, but ultimately if we see them continue to be um, a problem for other students or to the community as a whole, that's where we might hold them accountable at a higher level. Representative Kirk, what's the follow-up? Um, going with the, uh, if they come back another time, would there be a um, associated fee to said problem? Yeah, we, best practice in, in student conduct, some, some universities do assess fees um, as a, a quote unquote penalty. We're very rooted in being educational in our office, um, and so we um, have not looked at doing any sort of fees. The only fees at all that are associated with any part of student conduct is um, a couple of our um, outcomes um, might require them to go through a class or something that might have a small nominal fee. But again, if they can't afford that, we do work with them on that. Advisor Fonseca. I think there's this uh, preconceived notion that student conduct where you go when you get in trouble. Uh, can you talk about outside of accountability to university policies, what other things student conduct does for, for students on campus? Um, I remember that there was a, you all talked about it a lot last year, but can you kind of just refresh the folks who are watching and then the committee, other things outside of policy enforcement or accountability that you all do? Yeah, thank you, and I did fail to mention that. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. Um, so we're involved a lot with student orientation and other things on being proactive on educating people on, on their rights and their responsibilities on campus, and so that's obviously a big thing. The other piece that we've been involved with on a couple different times um, is working with whether it's student groups or, or just individuals on conflict resolution, and so if people are struggling finding ways to connect interpersonally um, and, and it's creating conflict that um, we do have folks in our office who will help um, work, help them work through those conflicts. Uh, again, the other piece is we are part of student affairs and um, we do partner with some of the events that happen across campus. And I will say, as someone who oversees both student housing and student conduct, student conduct staff are very involved with a lot of the housing things that go on, whether it's welcoming students to campus on move-in day or other things like that. So they're active members of campus-wide programming and other pieces as well. They just don't sit in their office and wait for people to do something wrong and deal with them, for sure. So thank you. The other, I, I've been talking about individuals and, and uh, Gabe reminded me, he oversees um, a lot of student organizations. So that is another piece. We do work with student organization violations as well. So that I should have mentioned that as well. Speaker Bellin. Yeah, sorry, this is a, a quick question and might just be a paperwork error that I'm seeing. So is your request uh, $119,746 or $121,488? You know, I saw that right before I came in too. Um, I, the first, when I when I put it in the the write up, um, that didn't include the increase to benefits, so it would be the one twenty one four eighty eight. Speaker Babbitt wants to follow up. Yeah, uh, can you also talk a little bit about? So I see where the the like roughly ninety thousand dollars is going for this for the uh, the salaries. Can you talk about like the other thirty or so thousand dollars and and what that goes towards paying for? Yeah, and as I as I mentioned a little bit earlier, so if you look at the scholarships, the seven thousand that is that is your mark towards a graduate assistant position. So that's that's a good chunk of it. And then if you move up a line, um, the capital outlay we do. Um, have t when we have in-person meetings with folks, we have tablets and stuff that we buy and upkeep, and so there is um, cost to just hardware and things in our office. Um, and then if you move up an item, that's that's more the copy machine and other things like, like I say, just the various um, office supplies that happen that, that we have to purchase each year. And then the top one, that's mostly the professional development area um, in terms of travel and um, you know, online courses that they go through. So that sort of details that. Does that answer? Okay. Are there any other questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you so much for coming to present to us. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you all very much. And again, I appreciate the work you all are doing. Good luck with the, all the rest of this.
with that, we will take a recess until 10 o'clock. And if you could be back maybe a little five minutes before so we can get started on time, that would be great. Yes.
audio check. One, two, three. Test, test, test. One, two, three. Interesting. Most students don't have enough money for it, so yeah. The, the problem arises with all the drops in ads, because at what point are you... Oh yeah. The only people that do are, are the people that have the 30 day delay are schools that um, because their uh, default rate is so high, they have to have a 30 day delay. A lot of students that potentially would not pay that. Who's left? Ours is. That's why we don't have to have that delay. Yeah. Schools that have a high health rate have to have a 30-day delay. Mostly it's community colleges. I mean, I guess we should have asked that question. Would you be okay with us delaying aid and... If you want it on, are you okay? pros and cons. I haven't, but I, after hearing yesterday, I wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to. Oh, okay.
good, they're good, yeah. You know,
Student Fees Committee will come to order. Is the opinion of the chair that all members are present. Madam Clerk, we're ready to proceed. Mr. Chairman, presentation number four is the Radigan Student Center. Their request is located on page 281 of the Fees Binder. Welcome, and thank you for coming to present to us today. You will have 15 minutes to present on your line item covering the topics that you think will aid the committee in its decision. Following that, we will have a question and answering period where we as the committee get to ask you questions about your budget. We will begin with introductions from the committee. My name is Zachary James. I serve as the student body treasurer and the chair of the student fees committee. Hi, my name is Maggie Hole, and I am the chairwoman of the budget and finance committee. Hi, I'm Olivia Babin. I am the speaker of the student senate. Hello, my name is Red Martin. I'm the representative for the Barton School of Business. Hi, I'm Glennis Jackson. I'm the representative for the College of Applied Studies. Hi, I'm John Kirk. I'm the representative for the College of Fine Arts. Hi, I'm Balaji Chandrasekharan. I'm the graduate student representative. I'm Sheila Sur, director of finance. Uh, Gabriel Fonseca, SGA advisor. Lauren Smith with the budget office. Jason Post with the budget office. Hi, guys. David Miller with the budget office. Hello, Sydney Brown, the College of Health Professions representative. And Moika, LAS representative. Hello, my name is Mackenzie Hassan, the student body vice president. Hello, my name is Taylor Fox. I am the clerk of the student senate. And with that, you may begin. <laughs> there you go. The wrong button. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Good morning, I'm Julia Caps. I'm the Director of Finance for the Radigan Student Center and the big screen behind me is, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, but you're muted. <laughs> um, good morning, I'm Kevin Condon. I'm the um, Associate Vice President for Student Affairs Auxiliary Services and Executive Director of the Radigan Student Center. Kevin, do you want to go ahead and start? Yep, I can go ahead and kind of start out. I'm going to kind of just kind of give you a little brief um, history and, and, and the setup of the Radigan Student Center. Um, basically, the Radigan Student Center is a 501c3 controlled affiliated corporation um, of Wichita State University. Really what that means is we're, we're kind of responsible for all of our own um, building maintenance, um, building janitorial services. We clean our own building. Um, maintenance, like I said, if equipment goes down, if, we're responsible for it. If damage in the building, we're responsible for it. If we need to build a new or put a new roof on, we're responsible for paying for a new roof. Any of that kind of stuff under maintenance, we're responsible for on our own. We're responsible, obviously you see Julia there, we're responsible for all of our own financial services. Um, from that side, we produce all of our own financial reports um, on a monthly basis. We're responsible for all of our own human resources, um, all those kind of things. So really we're, a, we're sort of an independent operation within the RADIC or within Wichita State University responsible for all of our own um, expenses and that kind of stuff. We're kind of a mixture between a business and a service. So basically what that means is we, we're here to provide a service to the students um, of the Radigan Student Center, provide meeting rooms, um, the spaces, those kind of stuff. Um, but we also operate as, as a business who generates revenue to help subsidize the need of student fees. So basically we just generate as much as we can to help offset the need of student fees as we go forward. So kind of go, go through a little bit of the budget process that we go through. Um, we start back in December and each de department within the um, Radigan Student Center um, prepares a budget for us. Um, and then at that time we sit down and meet, Julie and I meet with each director to go through their each individual budgets to kind of talk about where they're at, see what they're doing, um, give them some advice, those kind of things. And then those budgets are consolidated into a consolidated budget with, with which we see. So at that point, then we'd pass that on to the fee subcommittee of a board of directors. We're overseen by a board of directors, which some of you students set on. Um, then we present our full budget to that student fee, um, to the fee subcommittee of our board of directors. That was passed. And when that's passed, we pass that on to, to our full board of directors. Um, our full board of directors then pass that budget on um, as a past budget to the student sub fee committee. So that's just where we're at now into that process. So some of you have seen this budget um, several times, kind of have an idea where we're at. Some of the parameters that we're kind of dealing with this year, obviously with COVID and how that affects our operations. But what we did with the budget moving forward is basically budgeting for normal operations going into to next fall. 
So we're, we're budgeting as if things will be back to normal um, from, this, from this perspective. Now, we are looking at revenue. We, we're probably saying revenue is probably not gonna be back to what it was um, last year. So generated revenue, we, we figured at 75% of what normal would be kind of going into that. Now, obviously, if we go back into a year like, like this year, COVID has really played, it's really been hard on our generated revenue. So from bookstore, from Shocker Sports Grill and Lanes, those kind of stuff, revenues been down about 70%. So if we get into a situation like that, then we'll just have to adjust our budgets as we get into it, as we do, as we did for this past um, fiscal year. So as you can see through that, through all this process, um, we did not budget for a fee increase. We certainly understand where we're at as a, as a university and where the students are and trying to really manage our budget to where we, we weren't asking for a student increase. So we put that back on our directors in order to make, be able to make that happen. And they were able to make it happen for this next fiscal year. So now that's even with less generated fees um, or less generated revenue for going into next year where we're doing that. So now to be honest with you, the budget is pretty tight for next year. So um, what you're seeing is, is we really managed it and managed it really tied to where we're gonna be. So any probable reduction in generated revenue or um, fees coming in will probably result in, in a change in student services or result in change of operating hours, those kind of things to kind of to kind of keep us within budget as we go through this next year. So um, reserves, I'll talk just a little bit about where our reserves are. A lot of people talk about reserves. We really op talk about them as being operating funds. It's a little bit different than having um, money in reserve. When you think about a, a, a business, you can't just run on a zero budget. You have to have money in a bank to buy inventory, to pay for, um, to pay for your maintenance, to pay for um, um, anything that would come up, salaries, those kind of things when you're doing that. If you think about your, your checking account at home, you can't operate off of a zero, a zero budget or a zero volume in the bank. And so, we really consider our, our reserves as operating funds in order to operate. Remember, we're fully independent from the university from that side of it. So we need to, and our, um, our auditors recommend us having about a $5 million balance in our reserves as we move forward when we're doing that. So, you know, I think somebody asked me when we, we were going through some of the fee process on what would it mean if the Vatican Student Center wouldn't have student fees? I think the, the best answer would be that is there really wouldn't be a student center without student fees um, from that side of it. So we try to manage and operate the best we can, but without it, we just wouldn't be able to operate. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Julie and let her kind of go through the line items of the, of the budget and then open it up to questions. All right, thanks, Kevin. Um, you should have a copy of our budget in your packet. Uh, what we went forward with, as Kevin mentioned, is um, as optimistic as possible, but as realistic as possible as well. So uh, starting out with student fees, we did budget just for the amount of student fees that were allocated to us this year, which was a reduction over what was initially approved in the budget last year. So there's um, actually a $46,873 reduction in our request for student fees this year over the original budget last year. The student fees you see here are the majority of the fees. Another 153,000 that we received from student fees go down below in the other income section. And those are funds that we set aside in the budget to continue to fund our uh, technology fund and uh, building repairs maintenance fund. So. Um, not only is student fees down in this revenue section, but all of our revenue generating areas are a little bit down in this area. So the total reduction over prior year is 771,000. Um, the bright side of that is if you come down to the gross revenue, the amount available to cover costs outside of cost of goods is only down 214,444. Um, the wages section, you'll notice, is also down in total by about 176000 and that's just in alignment with the reduction in revenue. Um, they're all, uh, trending will 
impact the revenue due to the due to the reduction in revenue will impact the wages due to the reduction in revenue so that that reduction then in the fixed costs there's limited or very minimal pretty much flat budget compared to prior year budget due to the fact that those are the type of costs we really have minimal control over um, even during a pandemic we have you know limited control over what we can cut in that area all they do we um, were able to save in some areas due to the closure of the building last year. Variable costs in the budget uh, were operational costs were, are down 81,985. And that's, you know, all the other types of things that we can tend kind of rein in with um, intentional and uh, management type of decisions regarding um, whether we should spend those funds or not. So overall, uh, the net revenue before overhead is up in this budget by just 52,000. Um, coming down to the other income and uh, expense, that's kind of a odd area, but the biggest impacts in this area are the fact that our, our reserves are only earning a fraction of the interest that they earned previously. So, um, you know, lower interest rates to, to finance a home or a car equal lower interest rates for us on our savings. So there's a pretty substantial reduction in our interest from 70,000 last year to, to um, 10 this, this pro, uh, projected year. So basically, as we always do in the Writing and Student Center, we budget to try to reach a break-even budget, and we brought that all down to a proposed budget with a net loss of $1,842. Um, I, I, a lot of other people are sharing with you different information. You do have copies of our annual reports in, in your packet. It gives you some information on the traffic in the building, the type of activities that go on in this building as far as, um, you know, how we serve the students, how we operate, uh, what type of um, business we do here to keep students able to accomplish what they're here to do, which is learn and grow and go on and make a difference in the world. Um, one of the other things that we'd like to share with you today is, I don't know if this can be brought up. We had an anticipated, you gave a copy for him, okay. Um, we have Kevin and I, Kevin will probably expound on this a little bit more, but we have um, the, a list of reinvestment things that we need to do for this building um, as we continue to get farther from the, the uh, remodel. And so there's a listing of different types of things that we'll be looking to and required to do to serve the students the way we always have in the coming years. Everything from upgrading technology in classrooms, things like the screen behind you, um, the technology and lots, um, not classrooms, I'm sorry, meeting rooms and a lot of the meeting rooms needs to be upgraded um, for everything from, you know, just sheer age to being able to connect with the new technology that students are having. Um, and that runs eight to 10,000 per room. We've been able to accommodate two uh, upgrades um, between this year and last fiscal year, the olive room and this room. Um, we're in the proce process of evaluating all of the furnishings in the building and trying to make sure that um, we're either recovering, repairing, or replacing um, aged pieces of, of uh, furnishings in the building. Um, the, the things that are less fun and less pretty to fix but very much needed, the dishwasher in the main kitchen downstairs is in need of replacement. That's a fairly substantial investment of $200,000, we'll have to be looking at that over the next year or so. Um, one thing that we're constantly watching is the roof on the older part of the building, in, and it does need to be replaced at some point, which we had estimates in a in, uh, couple years ago, and that was as much as 450,000, probably a little bit more in today's terms, so that would be a huge investment for us from, from our building reserves as well. Um, there's several other items on here, everything from, you know, network infrastructure. You know, we upgraded 
wireless in the building, you know, there's just anything to do with technology and um, sound, video is always subject to a timeline of replacement to be, to still be viable. So we're, we're watching these type of things and we're planning so that we have resources to be able to um, set aside to take care of these type of things. Kevin, did you have anything else? Yeah, yeah. I just, you know, as I explained with, with us being an affiliated corporation responsible for all of our own maintenance and all of our own um, um, building upkeep from that side of it. So this is about a two to five year kind of look at where, where we're at with the Radigan Student Center. As Julia said, we're, we're about seven years out. It's hard to believe, but we're about seven years out now on our, on our remodel, which just means more projects are coming up. You know, we're starting to see wear and tear on furniture and, and those items within the Radigan Student Center. So we're going to get to a point where we need to start replacing them. Just to give you a rough idea, there's about a million dollars worth of furniture within the Radigan Student Center, um, probably on the low end. We don't really have a budget for technology from that side of it. So to come out of our daily budget, we're trying to get that worked in to where we can replace some of the technology within the building. But there's a lot of technology in the building at a, at a very, very high price to replace. We're, re we're really looking at needing to replace the technology within the ballroom. As you see, a couple of meetings room we've already done, but some of that technology is already out, to, out of date and needing to be re replaced. So, you know, a roof is something that we have to replace on our own. Um, we're on a, we're about 25 years into a 25 to a 30 year roof. So that's coming around the corner from that side of it, already starting to show a little bit of wear and tear and having some, some roof problems in the last few years. So that's probably a project that's gonna have to be done within the next two to five years of, from that side of it as a, at, a, at a cost of about $500,000. Um, so, you know, our kitchen equipment didn't get replaced within the remodel. So our, quit, our quit, kitchen equipment is something that the Radigan Student Center owns all of that. And it's gonna be looking and I'm putting a plan together to look to see how we replace all of the, all of the kitchen equipment within the, within the Radigan Student Center um, as far as that goes to. So just, just continued maintenance and projects that we have coming up that are gonna hit us within the next two to five years that we're gonna to have to stay on top of um, so that we don't get behind on where we're at, so. Are there any questions for the speaker at this time? Speaker Babin. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the bowling program since that's funded through this budget. Kevin? <laughs> Kevin, are you Sorry. there? Okay. No, I'm there. My phone okay. was going off, so I didn't. I was trying to get it to time to time to uh, <laughs> get it right. on mute before I before I got on mic again when we're doing that. The bowling mm -hmm. program, you know, the bowling program. We have one of the top bowling programs within the um, within the actually with universally as far as that goes, and certainly nationally. We have a nationally ranked bowling program, so it's that one oh twenty twenty national titles between the men and women's team. You know, our, our, we're very proud of the bowling program and, and what it's represented. We bring in about 60, oh, 60 students per year um, that, that come in to try out for the team. Um, we offer scholarships to those teams um, from that side of it. So, so we're bringing in them internationally. So we're bringing in um, bowling, bowling students from across the world um, into that bowling program um, downstairs. So, you know, they, they're responsible for generating a, a a lot of their revenue just through some funding efforts that they have um, through um, funding that they bring in through scholarships through donors and, and through the foundation and some of those kind of stuff but very proud of the bowling program and certainly are happy with where we're at with that so representative kirk as a follow-up with um, what speaker bradman said i'd like you to go more into um, billiards as well the, the billiards area downstairs as far as just the... You talk about Shuckers, Porch Mill and Lanes as a, as a whole or just billiards? Billiards is just specific. Okay. Well, basically... Uh, bill, billiards is not necessarily a program. It's just a service that we offer um, to the students. Entertainment. Um, and there's a, you know, basically that's a charge just like going downstairs and bowling um, from that side of it. So um, we do, we do, the university does um, offer a few classes of billiards within the Vatican Student Center, but that's something that we get paid from the university to host for them um, from that side of it to, to bring that in. So, so there's, there's some of that that goes on, but that's just part of that balance of the Shocker Sports Grill Lane between that service and that self-generating revenue that we have down there. And we certainly use that as a, uh, as a revenue generator as much as possible. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. 
chairperson Hall? I'm not sure what best practices right with unions around the country, but I was wondering the relationship between you and Chartwells of how you own the kitchen equipment, but Chartwells uses it and like is putting the wear and tear on it. So if you could just talk about that um, relationship. Um, you know, that's a, it is best practice. That's just the way most um, student unions do that when they, when they um, go out to bid for these. And there's some money built into these contracts when you see that they help replace the equipment. But even with the, even with the money that's built into these contracts up front. So in other words, when we, when we, when we contracted with Chartwells, um, there was about a million and a half that they brought in to do capital improvements. But what happens then with those capital improvements is that becomes university property as part of that contract. Basically, you get into those kind of contracts with that so that you're not trading out equipment. So in other words, if we change out Chartwells uh, at the end of their term, we're not replacing all of the equipment within the Radigan Student Center every time you're trying to change out a vendor when you're doing that. So the equipment comes in and stays ours. It's not necessarily all our cash all the time that goes to buy that. Some of that stuff is built in with that. And there's also funding within the contract on a yearly basis to either to help with maintenance of that, of that product when we go in there and also to help replace some of those equipment as it goes. So we have a replacement fund and a maintenance fund that we have with Chartwells to help with some of those expenses. Speaker Bobbin. Uh, so under question nine, which is the question uh, that asks you to provide a breakdown of all positions and their salaries. So are the only positions funded in the RSC through student fee dollars, student positions? That's a, no, not necessarily. The student fee position or the student positions are, are the ones that are truly um, funded by that. But really our, mix, our generated funds and our student fee funds are, are mixed as you see through our, through our line items when we're doing that. So really we're combining all of that together. So really you could sit there and say that um, really any salaries that are not being funded um, through generated revenue is then being subsidized through student fees. It's hard to break that down. Yeah, would it be possible for you to send a breakdown of all positions that are even partly funded through student fees so that we can see that. Sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the speaker at this time? All right, seeing none, thank you so much for coming out to present to us. Hope you have a great rest of your day. All right, Advisor Fonseca. Thank you. I do want to clarify or one piece as you see it in the big spreadsheet. Um, let me pull it up really fast. I, just to preemptively not have this question come up. Um, on line 36, um, you will see, right, the RSC's number is a lot larger than what it is in their budget. Um, keep in mind that line 36 is a set cost, that is a bond, um, that it's funded through student fees. Um, so 20, long time ago, I don't remember the year, um, student government approved the, um, the project to bond to the renovation of this building. Um, so that number is a set number. Um, so it's still a part of the RSC number, but it is to go to pay off that bond. Um, so just a clarification in there as you begin to look at numbers, not to be freaked out to say why there's another 2 million there or another 1 million there and that it's not included in their packet. So just wanted to add that. Thank you for that, Gabe. And with that, we will be recessing until... So, that do you just want to go ahead and just do SGAs and then have a longer break? Or do you want to do the break and then do SGA? If there are no objections, we can do SGAs now and then have a longer lunch break. All right, so we're going to do that. All right, so let's give it a second before we start. Yeah. Oh, damn.
before we begin, I know we wanted to test the clickers. Do we want to do that today or tomorrow? Okay. We can go. Mr. Chairman, presentation number five is the Student Government Association. Their request is located on page 309 of the fees binder. All right, so we're gonna skip all the fun stuff and get right to the budget. Um, so for SGA's uh, budget request, it's basically broke down into five different areas. Uh, the Student Government uh, General Fund, the Student organi Organization Fund, the Office of the Student Advocate Fund, the Scholarship and Hardship Fund, and our new fund, which is the Association of Agencies Fund. Um, this is a budget that the SGA Cabinet, Senate Leadership, and our advisor prepared. And it was introduced to the Senate and approved by a 33 to one vote of the Student Senate. So some of the big changes are um, we discussed the pay for our officials of student government and efforts to ensure that we are fairly compensating our workers effectively and fairly. Um, the Senate approved legislation that would increase each member's stipend to $15 an hour, as well as some increases in the hours worked for certain positions. Um, we also included a stipend that's currently being reviewed by the Senate for the student body uh, Chief Justice, we included that just in case it passes. If it doesn't pass, I'm assuming we won't need that money, but we included it just in case it does pass. Um, for the student, or, student and organizational fund, um, we created the Organization Appropriations Fund, which allows uh, RSOs and university groups to apply for an upfront budget for the fiscal year. Uh, that process is very similar to the student fees process, but just on a smaller scale. Uh, part of this funding is, is absorbing dollars allocated from student fees to student groups who receive uh, fees. And if you were here last year, there are some orgs that aren't here anymore. Um, orgs like that are going to be absorbed through the student uh, or through the Organization Appropriations Fund. Um, this is where they're going to get their money. Then the Office of the Student Advocate Fund is just similar to uh, the general fund where we just increase the pay. Um, they're separate just because they're technically not a part of the executive cabinet. They have their own budget. The scholarship and hardship fund, there's no change to this um, request. If you would like to know more about the specific scholarships and the specific amounts, I can talk about that later during the question period. And the newest one is the association agencies fund. This is a new area for SGA. It was created um, for special organizations uh, and they received a new status to be a part of SGA. This includes the Black Student Union, International Student Union, Spectrum, Graduate Student Council, First Generation Student Organization, Shockers Vote, Asian Student Council, and Hispanic, Hispanic uh, American Leadership Organization. Uh, these student groups are groups that the university expects to represent the university through programming and advocacy work and to advise senior student government leaders. Uh, this is money that is gonna be used to fund these agencies in their efforts. And to be transparent, uh, after reviewing our budget uh, and the student fees budget, we will be okay with a reduction of $100,000 from our request, uh, making the new request $716,000 and $716,097. Are there any questions? That was fun, all right. Now, I guess we will head into our lunch break which ends at one o'clock, one o'clock, oh, okay. All right, before we head out, I um, just wanna remind folks of a couple of things. We are beginning first round of deliberations today. We are not voting on the final budget today. Even if we get to a position where it feels like, oh, we're comfortable, we are still gonna do it all over again tomorrow so that we can spend some time sleeping on some of the decisions that uh, you all will have to make. So we will begin just the first round of discussion. When we come back, there'll be a few opening statements that people will give. Um, 
from various different areas. And so I remind you all again that you all have the opportunity to um, give an opening statement when we begin deliberation. So if you have one, please let Zach know so that we um, can put you down on the list. You don't have to have something prepared. You can just feel whatever, say whatever you feel like uh, you need to share with the rest of the committee as we begin uh, this discussion from there. Um, so make sure that you're back again five-ish minutes before so that we can start on time um, and then begin deliberations then. Cool? Questions, comments, concerns? When we get back, our good friend Lauren is going to show you the Excel sheet. Listen, it's intimidating, so just she will answer questions if we have any, but we'll, we'll go through that piece when that time comes. They're still working on finalizing some things before they send out something for you all to look at. If I know that there was a question earlier about seeing if you can get it, so they're still working on a couple things, and then once we have it ready, we'll send it out for you guys to look at it if you want to. Anybody other questions? Did you, yeah. I, I think we're ready to, I'll forward it on over to you. And if you guys want to use the break to take a look, you are welcome to. Awesome. All right. That is all that we have. All right. With that being said, we will be going to recess until one o'clock.
Could we get another sheet layout? Another sheet layout with the budget. Because mine's like all marked up. <laughs> I just wanted to. Oh. Yeah, you're good. Okay, friends, before we get started, for the voting members, you all have the clickers. That is how we're going to vote so we can easily just track it. Um, you're just going to use A for yes, B for no. Can you go ahead and turn your clickers on and just hit any random button so I know you're connected? Actually, hit A or B so I know you're connected. You'll have to, when you turn it on, hit A and then hit A again just so I know you're connected. And then hit any A, either A or B. You too, Zach. Okay. Someone didn't do it yet. N not this time. Okay, we're gonna do it one at a time, so hold up. All right, Palaji, you do it. No, just just tap it once. There you go. John? Okay, Glennis? Red? Olivia? Maggie? Zach? Zach, did you do it? Okay. Uh, Ann? And Sydney. Okay, wonderful. So again, red or red, huh? That's fun. A is yes, B is no. You cannot abstain in student fees. Make sure everybody heard me. You cannot abstain in student fees. Thank you. Otherwise, mine would look like that, too. <laughs> it would drive me crazy. Like, I couldn't visually do it. Yes, I always...
The student fees committee will come to order. It is the opinion of the chair that all members are present. Um, with quorum present, we will move on. Before we proceed into public forum, I will make an announcement. Uh, there was a question during hearings for campus recreation about, uh, I believe it was Speaker Babin who asked how many unique swipes the Hesker Center is getting and John Lee provided an answer. He said the answer is 6,830 unique swipes from faculty, staff, and students. This number does not include rentals, YMCA members, outside community members, and et cetera. So that's the answer for that. Advisor Fonseca. And then I have one from the, I think this was uh, Chair Hull who asked for the non-traditional student EOF funds. Um, so there have been 1,516, uh, this is just aggregate data that was submitted. 124 of those are unduplicated students that have been awarded. Um, 85 of the 124, so 68%, have received degrees or have pending degrees for the spring associates or higher. Um, and the 85 is the unduplicated student count. 11 of the 124, or 8.9%, um, are without degrees, um, but are still enrolled. I also have, and I'm not gonna say it out loud because there's a lot of them, the salary list from the RSE that Speaker Babin asked. Um, so I will forward that um, out because it's a long list. And I'm pretty sure those were all the questions that folks had that we got answers for. All right, thank you for that, Advisor Fonseca. Now we will proceed with the public forum. The association provided an opportunity to the community to address the committee via Zoom. Advisor Fonseca, has anybody requested to speak in public forum? Not outside from the community. Okay, so. Uh, seeing none, we will move on to the opening statements in, compli in compliance with the association bylaws. Uh, each member upon recognition is entitled to offer an opening statement. Are there any members of the committee wishing to present an opening statement at this time? Vice President Mackenzie Haas. Hi everyone. So just for some context, this year we reinstated, SGA reinstated the Health and Wellness Advisory Board, so that is consistent of uh, Campus Recreation, Student Health Services, Counseling and Prevention Services, the YMCA, um, and then our care team as well. So on behalf of the Health and Wellness Advisory Board, you all have this in your little purple folder, but I will read it out loud, that the board has voted to recommend the prioritization of Student Health Services' goal of providing a full-time doctor and Counseling and Prevention Services' goal of providing more counselors for students. These goals coincide with the current prioritization of student health across campus, and as we grow in size as a university, it's necessary to provide health and wellness services for our students to grow as well. Additionally, in the midst of the pandemic and a mental health crisis, it's more important than ever that we are putting student health before all else. So with these things in mind, the Health and Wellness Advisory Board asks that you, can, you consider um, their budgets and their requests with uh, great consideration. That's a lot of rep repetition, but thank you. You know what I'm saying. Thank you, Vice President Haas. Is there any other member of the committee wishing to make an opening statement? Representative Kirk. Yes, real quick. I just want to um, remind everybody that as we go through um, the deliberations for the next couple of days, um, I want to remind people that this is not just only our money, this is all of our constituents' money. And we should not be just putting numbers so we can get the numbers correct on the screen because those numbers on a screen represent somebody that you know. So let's be um, not accusing anyone at all, but let's all, as we're making cuts, as we're going through or however we're doing this, as we continue the next couple of days, please remember that these decisions that we make are going to be impacting not only you, but every single individual that is on this campus. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kirk. Speaker Babin. Yeah, as we start this process, I want to remind, not really remind everybody, but just kind of just discuss, I guess, the fact that obviously we wanna keep this number as low as we possibly can. Um, students are struggling right now. We wanna make sure that they're not having to pay for things they don't need or things that they, just we want to make sure that students aren't paying 
really anything more than they have to. But I also want us to remember that all of these things provide good services to students that will enhance their education and enhance their experience at Wichita State. And those things are worth money. So, you know, as great as it would be for us to give a 0% or even a decrease in student fees, we want to make sure that we are keeping the services that help our students and giving more of the services that help our students. Um, so just balancing those things between the things that students need to succeed on this campus uh, and the financial implications of what those mean. So remember both of those things as we are going through all of these budgets. Thank you, Speaker Babin. Are there any other members of the committee wishing to make an opening statement? Seeing none, I know that student body president, Rija Khan, is going to come in to make her opening statement. Um, is she ready? Sorry, I haven't used this mic in a while, so it feels weird. But hello, everyone. My name is Rajal Khan, and I'm the student body president. First, I would like to start off by thanking each and every single one of you here for doing the work, for giving this committee your time and having all the discussions that are needed. And also, thank you for allowing me to come speak and address you all as to what I guess I'd like to see after the de deliberations. Now. We all know that this pandemic has affected all of us and the people around us in many different ways, how it has affected the higher ed world and how we have to make tough decisions. I understand that everyone here has been looking at these binders very carefully. I know you all are having discussions about what is essential thing, what are the essential projects we all need to fund and what are the non-essential ones that we can, I guess, delay for a year, whatever that may look like. Knowing that this work is very difficult, and again, I'm very appreciative of each and every single one of you for doing it. I wanted to kind of give you my insight as to what I would like for you all to consider as you all will be moving into deliberations pretty soon. I would like for you to consider a number around the 1% increase. Now, do know, I do say 1% increase as a consideration. It is not a percentage that you all would be binded to. If you all go in and you deem certain areas extremely essential where you have to go fund it, and then certain areas non-essential, I understand that that number may come out to be different. So again, as you all are going into the conversations, deliberations, 1% is something I would like for you to consider. Otherwise, whatever you all come up with, I will be probably listening to through the YouTube live stream. And I would love to return tomorrow and I guess address you all one, once again, once I have heard you all you know, go over the essential areas that you deem fit for student fees to fund. So with that, again, thank you all for doing this work. I am really, really appreciative of it. And I guess I stand for any questions. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, are there any other opening statements? Advisor Fonseca. Thank you, yeah. So I quickly just want to go over um, what is gonna happen today. Um, in your folder, I printed out the funding strategies document. Um, so this is language that's directly from um, the SGA rules and regulations that govern the student fees process. Um, it is a very different um, thing than we've seen in the past. Uh, this summer, uh, there was a task force that was put together uh, to review changes to the student fees process. Uh, a part of that came three um, substantial outcomes um, that have changed it. 
Um, and these are kind of options that we can look at and tools that are your, at your disposal as a committee um, as well. So I just want to briefly go over them so that you know what those are. Um, so a part of the annual three-year review um, cycle, pro we provided three different options for the committee and ultimately the Senate to consider. Uh, the first one is you can keep the entities and the tier one status, uh, which means that there is no change to their base dollar amount uh, for the next three years or until the next time that they present uh, to the committee. You can also put them in a tier two status, which is um, an increase that is spread over the course of three years. So the example I gave you, if an entity receives $20 for this upcoming fiscal year, you can automatically write in an increase for the next fiscal year and automatically write in an increase for the fiscal year after that. Um, or based on how, uh, when they return to the fees committee. So it kind of gives you that option to spread things across two to three years um, instead of putting it all up front from there. Or the third tier um, is a reduction over the course of a time period as well. So instead of hitting um, an, uh, an entity with uh, a decrease in one year, you can spread it over the next two years, spread it over the next three years, again, just depending on when they come back uh, to the fees committee. You won't necessarily see that number up on the screen because we're just focused on this fiscal year. Um, so the second section of that is the funding commitments. Those are where we'll write in those increases or those automatic decreases um, over the course three, uh, the next two to three years as well. On top of that, we'll also be drafting um, these funding commitments, which basically takes the information that this committee and that the Student Senate, when the uh, funding bill goes to them, um, that kind of sets out the proposals and the insurances uh, and commitments that we, the student government, and them, the entity, um, are making that kind of governs that funding for the uh, course of the two to three years. Um, they'll be signed by both groups so that they kind of know this is what it is, and we'll consider those um, binding documents within our legislative journal that kind of sets that's the standards for that funding. And that's where we'll have what the next fiscal year or the fiscal year after that will look like. Questions about either of those two things? Wonderful. Um, I also put in there the cycle so that you know when these groups will be coming back. Let's be honest, some of you won't be here because you're graduating, so congratulations. But for those who aren't, um, you can see that next year we'll start the three-year cycle with year A, um, and there will be five groups that will come to the fees committee uh, to present their budget. So those areas will only be funded for one year, and then they'll have to return in the next year to do this process all over again, while year B and year C, um, and I kind of give you the, the fiscal years of what those fiscal year budgets are, is when the committee will see them again. So that kind of just lays out um, the schedule for those areas. Any questions about that? Wonderful, okay. The last pieces that I wanna talk about are just some things that to, as you all have your discussions today. Um, one, I wanna talk a little bit about the Educational Opportunity Fund, because I know there's been some conversations and some questions about that. Um, in our legislative journal, there are four things that govern um, those fund areas. They just have to meet one of the four. One is that they have to be an academic scholarship or fellowship for both graduate and undergraduate students. Two, they have to be need-based need grants, including awards to students with special expenses, such as childcare or groups of students who have been historically underrepresented in higher ed. Three, salaries or grants for students participating in public or community service programs. And four, salaries for students employed in campus student service programs, such as tutoring, daycare, or peer counseling. Again, they only have to meet one of those four in, a, in order to be eligible um, for the EOF areas. I wanna to move to salaries really quick, because I imagine those will be some questions as well. Um, it has been a commitment that the association has made in good faith effort not to discuss salaries of positions that have already been funded by student fees, which means they have gone through the process um, to approve the position or the funding for that area. Um, this commitment extends to positions that have already been approved in the past by the association. Um, however, um, the commitment also is still contingent if, if contingent on if funding is available. So if there's no money, then right, what are we gonna do about that? Um, however, this does not extend to new positions that are being requested in a review year or non-mandatory salary increases such as raises. Um, the association does have discretion on whether they approve or deny those by not providing funding and now limiting those expenditures in the funding agreement. So I just wanted to clarify some of those pieces. 
Additionally, there was a new policy that was put in place, um, and we actually got to use it for the first time um, this year, um, on restrictions of the use of funds. This limits the ability for um, student fees to be transferred between one entity to another without the, without the permission um, of the student senate. We just had this example with um, the RSC funding that the senate approved two weeks ago, feels like two weeks ago. Um, so that is one thing that has also um, been put in place from there. Additionally, new this year, um, and you kind of heard the reason why earlier, um, we are now required to annually transfer 1% of the student service fee um, automatically into the contingency fund. This is to help us build um, a contingency within um, the student fees account, right? For example, the shortfalls or issues, or to also fund supplementary uh, initiatives or special projects. This year, that means that the committee, based off of the new projection number, has to find $88,000 to transfer into that fund. Um, the transfer to that fund will stop when the account hits a million dollars. It's not near that, so we've got to keep doing it. Um, and then the last piece, as we get to the part talking about reserves, um, a new, another new policy has been put in place to say that individual entities are not allowed to store more than 10% of their year one base budget um, in their reserves account. Um, anything that exceeds that, um, where the committee is allowed to withdraw it, but also you're allowed to withdraw reserves if you feel necessary to do so. So to wrap it up, I promise, here's what the, we gotta do today, today and tomorrow. Um, we gotta set the per student allocation of each entity using the three tier, three -tier strategy, so I encourage you um, to use those. You gotta balance the budget, so you can't approve more than what we have. Um, you have to meet the 1% contingency allocation. We'll have to have the conversation about the cost of living increase um, that has been uh, presented twice um, in the uh, estimates. Um, sending those, whatever those funding expectations are of, for the funding agreements and commitments. We have to review the shortfall for fiscal year 21. And then at the end of the day, we have to vote on determining what the rate of student fees will be. So we have a lot of things to do and we have the time to do it, but let's make sure we use the time effectively um, and we'll go from there. That is all that I have for you. Are there any questions for Advisor Fonseca, Speaker Dobbin? Uh, yeah, on EOF, if there are services in EOF that we don't believe match the EOF fund, what do we do about that? Um, so if they don't meet one of those four, um, or right, if you don't believe that they meet one of those four areas, um, then right, I would encourage you all to write that in a vote. So get it in a vote to do so. Um, make the decision whether you're gonna fund it or to transfer it over to the student services area. But ultimately that will be the decision that the Senate will have to make um, whether or not they agree with you or not. But for our purposes, right, you can determine where that funding goes from, yeah. Yes. Would that have to be a separate bill from the student fees? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, no, we'll still, put it, we'll still put in the big student fees bill. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, Thanks it's going to be a hefty bill. Are there any other questions for Advisor Fonseca? Seeing none. Thank uh, you. Move, Madam Clerk, we are ready to proceed. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to committee regulations as set by the bylaws by the chair, the chair shall entertain motions for allocation for each fund per line. Each motion must be seconded and then the original member to author the motion shall have the chance to speak first. The chair will then proceed member by member who wishes to speak on the motion. A reminder to the committee that amendments may not be made to the motion. Each motion must be voted on or retracted by the member with no friendly amendments will be accepted. Finally, each line item is limited to no more than 30 minutes of debate. However, a motion may be made for an extension of, de of debate by simple majority vote. I do have a question about this. Um, so it says that the chair will proceed member by member when it comes to making speeches. I know in the Senate you have to do speech of affirmation, speech of negation. Do you have to do that here? No. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Lauren? And whenever you guys are ready, could I have a second to like walk you through the, okay, awesome. Are there any other questions? All right, uh, Lauren, before we begin, I guess if you want to walk us through it. Sounds great. And Gabe, I think I gave you um, not, I didn't realize what the 1% you were asking was for. Um, if you're looking for 1% of total fee rev, um, student fee revenue, it would be 97,663. That was the traditional students, and of course there's like TAP and all that stuff, so. 
that is your updated number there. So for this spreadsheet, you know, we can go line by line. Um, you guys should have gotten Excel copies of this document and you can make changes here to see, you know, what would happen if you did like a 1%, a 1.5, and you can see the change to an individual student, like what they pay in their student fees there will automatically update. Um, the other thing off to the side, you can see um, hold on. what like a tier one, like what one student would pay if you were a tier one student. Um, I have information for all of the other tiers as well, but it gets a little bit messy to look at. So I will probably, if you ever want to see those, let me know and I can, you know, scroll over and show you. But for the um, purposes of keeping things simple, we can just look at those tier one. And that will only look right and like be calculating absolutely correctly when the budget is balanced like it is right now. You can see this is how we'll end with the zero um, variance. I had just gone ahead and plugged um, student health really fast so I could show you what it looks like when it is balanced. And as we put that back, you can see that we are currently um, $458,909 over, um, over the revenue on if you guys adopted a 0% increase. And um, also we would have to find that 97,000 uh, for the reserve. So with that being said, are there any questions? And if you guys ever wanna see like what it would look like with a different increase or on different lines, I can add those in. Speaker Babin. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is probably just me not paying attention, but can you explain the difference between like a tier one student and a tier two student? like what that difference is between those types of students, I missed it. Absolutely, um, tier one is a full-time student taking, what is it, like nine hours or more. Um, tier two, I think is between, I don't know, it's like nine to six-ish. If you want me to, Lauren, I, I have it right here. Okay. So for, for an undergraduate student, they will, for tier one, they'd be taking nine or more credit hours. For tier two, six credit hours up to and including 8.75 credit hours. And tier three, up to and in, from zero and up to and including 5.75 credit hours. And then for a graduate student, um, it's a little bit lower because they traditionally take less credit hours. For tier one, it's seven or more credit hours. For tier two, four credit hours up to and including 6.75 credit hours. And tier three, zero up to and including 3.75 credit hours. And uh, the, I know this got maybe sent to you electronically, but there is a table in that uh, slide deck. This slide has a brand. That's helpful. Are there any other questions? Chairperson Hall. I'm messing around with the spreadsheet, Lauren. For half percentage, I tried to put in 0.5 and it didn't like me. So what do I have to put in for that? Um, probably 0 0.05. Okay. Well, actually, no. Hold on. 0.5. There you cool. go. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions at this time? All right. Seeing none, let's have fun. Madam Clerk, we're ready to proceed. Line item number two is the cultural ambassador program. They requested 42 cents per student for the fiscal year 2022, and they're located on page 272 of the fees binder. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any motions from the committee? All right. Seeing none, um, 
Madam Clerk, you may proceed. Line item number three is debate. They requested 83 cents per student for fiscal year 2022 and are located on page 157 of the fees binder. Are there any motions from the committee? Uh, let me clarify. We, we have to set a number. So as we go in order, the motions are basically saying whether you're going to give them the money, not give them the money, make a change to the number. So can we scoot back to the cultural ambassador program? Uh, so we got to, I guess that made sense. I should have clarified that. The motion is basically saying, right, you're either moving to approve the number, denying the number, changing the number, or whatever it is, and then we'll debate on whatever that motion is. So let's scoot back to the cultural ambassador program. On what page was that? Uh, on page 272 of the fees binder, they requested 42 cents per student. Laura. And could I have, um, when you guys are talking about what you want their allocation to be, could we talk in like their actual dollar amount and everything? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Awesome. So just to clarify, even if we are keeping the number the same, we still have to vote on keeping the number the same. Um, so moving back to line item number two, cultural bachelor program. Are there any motions on the line item? Chairperson Hull. Um, with a motion to keep their allocation the same at 42 cents per student or $10,000. Is there a second to this motion? Second. Yeah. Seconded by Speaker Babin. Um, Person holds that she made the uh, motion. You may speak on said motion. Yes. So um, when they came in to have um, a conversation with us, I thought their program was really amazing. Um, I think it adds a lot of great things to our campus of students getting um, to learn more about people from different um, countries and cultures and all of that. And I think it really adds um, a very rich experience while also allowing students from other countries to come and experience America. So um, I think the $10,000 um, is a really great way that we can kind of offset the expenses um, that those students face when they come um, to study at Wichita State. Thank you, Chairperson Hull. Is there a second member wishing to speak on the motion? Seeing none, we will now vote on the allocation of $10,000 to the Cultural Ambassador Program. Oh, you can go ahead. It's either A, yes, B, no. And we'll wait till everyone casts their vote. And I don't get to vote. No. Unless there is a tie. There's a tie. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, there was eight in favor, zero against, the motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Uh, Madam Clerk, we can proceed. Line item number three is debate. They requested 20,000 for fiscal year 2022 and are located on page 157 of the fees binder. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any motions from the committee? Speaker Babin. Uh, I move to keep the uh, allocation for debate at 83 cents per student or $20,000. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Kirk. Speaker Babin, it is your motion, so you may speak. Um, I think that uh, this is, obviously it's a scholarship and I want our students to keep as many of the scholarships uh, as they currently have. Uh, I also think that debate is an extremely rigorous program uh, and the fact that we are able to compensate every single student involved in this incredibly rigorous program, I think is a really great asset to our university, to our debate, to and to our debate program. I'm not sure uh, how well our debate program would be able to to exist without this this scholarship money. So I fully support f support keeping their their allocation the same. Thank you, Speaker Babin. Is there a second member wishing to speak in favor or wishing to speak um, on the motion, Representative Kirk? Yes, I just want to um, reiterate uh, what Speaker Babin has said. Um, I was able to speak with the speaker that came and spoke about debate, 
and um, some things that he uh, neglected to say in uh, the presentation is just um, what they do for uh, not only the university but for the students. The, the fund, yes, is a scholarship because they value the students to be able to do what they love and what they're wanting to go ahead and do. And uh, some of the colleges that they go up against are not just like KU, K-State, and we're talking Harvard, uh, big law firm, law, not law firms, law colleges predominantly that are very well known. We have beaten them before. So to be able to continue funding this would be a very good um, continuance in this program. I highly will be uh, voting in favor for this. Thank you, Representative Kirk. Is there a number, another member wishing to speak on the motion? Seeing none, we will go into the vote. Member A for yes, B for no. The vote was eight to zero, the motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Falteca, Madam Clerk. Line item number four is disability support services. They requested 11,500 in total, which is 48 cents per student and are located on page 87 of the feed binder. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there a motion on the line item? Chairperson Hall. Um, I would like to do a motion to move this line item from EOF to student support services. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Speaker Babin. Chairperson Hall, is your motion so you may speak. Thank you. So through conversations that we have had um, with um, this office, a lot of what they do is more programming um, than any of the following items that uh, Advisor Fonseca said at the beginning of our hearing. Um, they are doing great programming and that's fabulous, but at the end of the day, they are not meeting the EOF requirements. Um, so they need to be moved down to student support services um, where it makes more sense for what they're doing in their office. Thank you, Chairperson Hall. Is there another member wishing to speak on said motion? Not speaker. Vice President Haas. Can I ask a question? Um, would this be considered need-based? Is that for us to, as a committee to decide, or is that something? So, right, so you gotta think about that. It, the four options that the journal gives you are either academic scholarships, a needs-based grant, um, which includes awards to students with special expenses, um, salaries or grants to students participating in public and community service, or salaries for students employed on campus, uh, in-campus student services program. So right, the discussion now is, does it meet one of those four, yes or no? Or does it continue to meet one of those four, yes or no? Chairperson Hall. Vice President Haas. So then I guess my question would be posed to the committee. Do you all believe that this is a need, needs-based, I don't know, service? Thank you. Vice President Haas, Speaker Bevan. I think that the, so what this provides is in their packet, they don't talk about, they don't give money directly to students. They can provide them with extra services, but they aren't, it's not a grant, it's not a scholarship. They aren't giving this money directly to the student, they are providing them with a program, which is not what EOF is intended for. EOF is intended to be money given directly to students. For, it can be for a specific purpose, but that's not really what this is doing. This is providing a new program, which would then make it a student support service, not an educational opportunity fund. Thank you, Speaker Babin. Vice President Haas. For clarification's sake, I agree with that. Thank you, Vice President Haas. Is there any other member wishing to speak on the motion? Representative Balaji. Uh, I was just looking through their packet and they say that they have a UF scholarships for students, uh, for the DSS students. Is that something which, I mean, understanding it wrong? That Point of inquiry, can you say what page that is, just so I can turn to it? 
I, I'm sorry, I can't hear oh, you. Sorry, uh, is it 87 or? 87, okay, thank you. And just adding to that, uh, they have a scholarship, uh, they have $8,000 $8, worth of scholarships and 2,000 for student salaries. That's almost more than, almost 90% of their budget. This, that, that's a different org on page 97. They're really similar in name. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wait. Wait, it, this is? I guess, no, that is right. So for this line, I think it is $8,000 in scholarships on page 91. But there are two that are really similar, so you might be thinking about the other one. I would like to retract my motion, but I have a separate motion. So the original motion to move it is retracted. Chairperson Hull does have another motion now. Is there anyone else looking to make a motion on the slide item? Okay, with a motion. Speaker Babin. Uh, so I move to, and I can't do the math, so I'm gonna ask you to do it for me. Um, I would like to move to bring Disability Support Services uh, budget to $8,000, subtracting 3,500, providing money for the scholarship only. So before I approve the motion, I wanna ensure that the number is correct, so. If we only want to cover the scholarship, Lauren, is that the correct motion? Yes, so we would cover $8,000. Yeah, yeah 8,000 okay. would be just the amount of the scholarship. So, with that being said, the motion on the floor is to only provide $8,000 to Disability Support Services. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Seconded by Representative Kirk. Speaker Babin, it is your motion, so you may speak on it. Um, so, I want, I want to fund any scholarship that, that we give to students. Uh, my concern with the, I, as much as I love the programming provided uh, by Disability Sur Support Services, Disability Support Services receives funding from the federal government to provide those services. Um, and I think it's important for us, for us to recognize this, that they, they have other ways in which to fund these things. Um, and the other things are, are not an EOF. Um, so if they, we could move things around, but I think that our, our best opportunity to fund the things that we need to fund, get our number down to what we need to, is to fund the scholarship portion of this request uh, and not fund the rest of this request. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Babin. Is there any other member wishing to speak on the motion? Sen not Senator, Representative Balaji. Uh, I'd like to oppose this because they are just uh, supporting just one student tutor and they have uh, uh, almost 15 student employees out of which they are asking only to support one of them from our student fees. So I, if it's possible, I would like to skip the commodities line from that, uh, from their budget and add the $2,000 and maybe even, uh, they are increasing the student uh, uh, per hour pay by 75 cents, maybe we can look at that to, to reduce it. I don't want to take away the student tutor part of it. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Sen Representative Balaji. Advisor Fonseca. So you couldn't do that because you can't make amendments to motion. So the original motion will either have to be tabled to pick this one up or vote it on and then reconsider the motion as well. So you can't uh, make an amendment on a current motion. I just interpreted it as a speak in negation and that would just lead us to voting against. So that's how. I'm making that motion. Then yeah, you would either, you would need to vote on Speaker Babin's motion first and then make that one or table the motion made by Speaker Babin and then vote on this one and pick this one back up. Especially if you're making the motion to do so. We would have to vote on tabling it, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, 
Chairperson Hall. I would like to speak on Speaker Babin's point as well. Um, so these programs get $6 million of federal funds um, and the programming that we would be cutting is only 3,500. And I think they can find that or write it into their grant in the future. Um, I don't think that this small amount of money that we're cutting in order to make our budget work um, is going to detrimentally harm these students that are in this program. Again, $6 million of federal funds um, versus the 3,500 that we're gonna cut um, to make our budget work for all of our students um, is very important to remember. Thank you, Chairperson Hall. Representative Kirk. Yes, and just a um, reiteration, uh, I am a student of, uh, that is in this uh, area, and this, this would not be something that would be, in my perspective and what I see, would not be something that would be detrimental again uh, from what I have experienced with this, within the service and through um, the years that I've been doing this, I do think that this would be a good um, motion to do. Thank you, Representative Kirk. Are there any other members wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Representative Martin. Um, I think that I will have to support this. Um, as uh, Representative Kirk said, um, I also use these services. And I am struggling with this decision because as much as I would enjoy the student tutor to be funded, unfortunately we are facing extremely tough decisions this time around. Um, students do have many other options when it comes to tutors. Um, so even if the worst situation were to happen and that tutor would be dropped, um, I am confident in knowing that the students who seek out the services would still have the ability to find tutors somewhere on campus. Thank you, Representative Martin. Are there any other members wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Seeing none, we will move to vote on the uh, motion to fund $8,000 to Disability Support Services. You may now vote. A is for yes, B is for no. The vote is seven to one, the motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Uh, Clerk Fox, you may proceed. Line, uh, line item number five is the Graduate Student Scholarship Program. They requested $10,000, which is 42 cents per student. They are located on page 189 of the fees binder. Thank you, Clerk Fox. Is there anyone wishing to make a motion on the line item? Chairperson Hall. Um, with a motion to fund them um, the full 10,000 or 42 cents per student. Is there a second? Second. Second by Representative Kirk. Chairperson Hall, this is your motion, so you may speak. Yeah, so um, as a grad student, I will speak in that format. Um, this is a really great way um, to kind of bridge the gap if a student can't take a full amount of um, credit hours that semester or if they're um, facing dropping out. Um, it is really important that we are encouraging our students to further their education in one form or, or another. Um, so I think this is a really great um, bridging of the gap, per se, um, that we can support our students with. Thank you, Chairperson Hall. Are there any other members wishing to speak on the motion? Seeing none, we will move into the vote to fully fund the Graduate Student Scholarship Program. You may now vote A is for yes, B is for no. The vote is eight to zero, motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Clerk Fox, we're ready to proceed. Line item number six is the McNair Graduate Student Scholarship. They requested $9,000, which is 37 cents per student. They are located on page 192 of the fees binder. Are there any motions on the line item? Um, Speaker Babin. Um, I move to adopt the budget as it is with a with ninety nine thousand dollars is there a second second seconded by representative morka um speaker babin it is your motion so you may speak on it 
Yeah, uh, I love scholarships. <laughs> um, I don't think that we should uh, defund our scholarships. So that is, that's my whole argument. Thank you. Is there any other member wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Seeing none, we will vote on the motion to fully fund the McNair Graduate Student Scholarship at $9,000. You may now vote. A is for yes, B is for no. Voted eight to zero, motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Clerk Fox, we're ready to proceed. Line item number seven is the HALA Scholarship Award for Community Service. They requested $15,000, which is 62 cents per student. They are located on page 43 of the Peace Binder. Thank you, Clerk Fox. Is there a motion on the line item at hand? I make motions? All right. Well, I move to fully fund the $15,000 uh, community service scholarship. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Speaker Babin. My motion, I get to speak on it. Um, as a previous representative said, scholarships are cool. Let's, let's fund the scholarships. That's my speech. Uh, would anyone else like to speak on the motion? Seeing none, we will vote to fully fund the scholarship for community service at $15,000. A is for yes, B is for no. The motion is eight to zero, motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Clerk Fox, you may proceed. Line item number eight is the historically underrepresented student grants. They requested $50,000, which is $2.08 per student. Um, they're located on page 225 of the fees binder. On correction, it's $2.08 that matters. Thank you, Clerk Fox. Is there a motion on the line item? Representative Martin? I move to approve the full budget. Is there a second? Can you say the exact number, please? Uh, for 50,000. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Moika. Representative Martin, it is your motion, so you may speak first. Uh, I just think it's uh, very important for this fund to go to the underrepresented students of WSU. Thank you, Representative Martin. Are there any other members wishing to speak on the motion? Seeing none, we will vote on fully funding the historically underrepresented student grant at $50,000. You may vote now. A is for yes, B is for no. Vote it's eight to zero. Motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. <laughs> Clerk Fox, we're ready to proceed. Line item number 10 is SGA scholarships. They requested $34,500, which is $1.44 per student. They are located on page 309 of the fees binder. Is there a motion on the line item at hand? Representative Kirk. Yes, besides the fact that scholarships are awesome, I think this is a great um, opportunity for SGA to be able to give back to the students more and be able to show the students that we are there for them. Is that a motion to... Oh, sorry. I have... <laughs> Jeez. A motion uh, to adopt the full request of the... God of the full 34,500 from the student government scholarship. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Speaker Babin. Representative Kirk, um, you, if you want to speak again on your motion. What I just said. <laughs> All right, thank you. 
Is there anyone else wishing to speak on the motion? Seeing none, we will be voting on fully funding the SGA scholarships at $34,000. $34,500. You may now vote. We are still missing a vote. All right, the vote is eight to zero. The motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Clerk Fox, we are ready to move on. Line item number 14 is the Multicultural Student Mentoring Program. They requested $30,000, which is $1.25 per student. They are located on page 104 of the fees binder. Is there a motion on the line item? All right, I will make a motion. Uh, I motion to fully, f I move to fully fund the Multicultural Student Mentoring Program at $30,000. Um, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Kurt. Um, so as a former member of MSMP, I know the work that they do, and I know the um, benefits of being in the program. I know a lot of the people that receive the scholarships and how well they're doing now because of it, and I just think it should be fully funded. Um, is there anyone else wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Seeing none, we will move into the voting period. Um, we are voting to fully fund the Multicultural Student Mentoring Program at $30,000. You may now vote. The vote is eight to zero. The motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Before we move on, I will just say at any time, if you all want to motion for a recess, feel free to do it, Advisor Fonseca. I'm sorry, I messed it up. Can we do that vote again? I forgot to change the slide. Now we're ready to vote. So let's do that vote one more time. Sorry. So going back to vote on the Multicultural, stu mentoring, multicultural Student Mentoring Program at $30,000. Now you may vote. A is for yes, B is for no. The vote is eight to zero, the motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. So going back to what I was saying, if you all at any time um, want to recess for like five minutes or whatever, all you have to do is just make a motion to do so. Um, Representative Kirk. I would like to mo uh, motion to recess for five minutes, please. Are there any objections to the motion? Seeing none, we will recess for five minutes. Olivia, can you come here?
uh, if we can all collectively agree that it's hot in here, maybe we can lower the temperature, because I also believe it is very hot in this room. <laughs> Second. <laughs> The Student Fees Committee will come to order. It is the opinion of the chair that all members are present. Not roll call. We will go back into um, the line items at hand. Madam Clerk, you may proceed. Line item number 15 is the Student Support Services Program. They requested $17,000, which is 71 cents per student. They can be found on page 11 of the Fees Finder. Is there a motion on the line item? Speaker Babin. Uh, I move to adopt a budget of $4,500 for this line item. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Chairperson Hall. So the motion is to fund $4,500, am I correct? to the Student Support Services Program. Uh, Speaker Babini is your motion, you can speak first. So this program is very, very similar to the Disability Support Services Program. Um, and of their $17,000 budget, they only use $4,500 for scholarships, um, which is what is reflected in their goals. So if you look at on page 12, goal two, they give out $4,500 in scholarships. Uh, this is another program, just like Disability Support Services, that receives federal funding. I did find the roughly exact number <laughs> that they give. They get $3.9 million from the government, from the federal government, roughly every year. Um, and it consistently goes up. We should not be funding the extra things. Those are things they can, they can fund with that uh, federal grant money, so I believe that we should only fund the scholarship uh, that they offer. Before we move it to speeches on the motion, Lauren? Um, if you turn to page 18, I think the amount that they're requesting for scholarships is $6,486. I just don't see where the rest of that is discussed, unless that is an increase in scholarship money. Uh, that they are requesting, but I would like to still keep my motion at 4,500 for scholarships. Thank you for the information though, I appreciate it. Thank you again, Lauren. Um, so the motion still on hand is $4,500 to student support services. Are there any other speeches on this motion? Chairperson Hall. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna be voting in affirmation for this motion. Um, while these programs are fabulous and they are amazing, um, the money that they do get already from the federal government is increasing and they can write it into their grant to get money for that. So it is very important that our money, as I've said before, <laughs> is going to um, scholarships, especially in this fund, um, and then making sure that we are balancing our budget while still supporting um, the whole student um, at the university. Thank you, Chairperson Hull. Is there any other members wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Representative Balaji? Uh, I'd like the committee to think about it a little bit uh, because uh, they do have this uh, software or the access to uh, this, this remote uh, work shadow uh, uh, program which they do. Uh, and, and also considering the fact that they have been getting the federal funds for, I mean, forever when, for since they have been created and every time they do try to use up, I mean, they do use up their, their budget, which we give them. So that means they are in the requirement of these funds. And, and, and I'm just worried that we might be taking the, that one opportunity for, uh, for them to have a, an internship or even a paid internship uh, away from the students who are part of this program. 
So I would move at least to add the 8514 if this motion is taken down. Sorry. Speaker Babin. Uh, I appreciate the, the comment and concern made by uh, uh, Representative Balaji, but I also think that these are, these are programs that are already extremely well-funded. Um, we want to make sure that our money is being used to programs that aren't as well-funded that need these student dollars to function and provide services to students that they would not get otherwise. Um, as great as I think the virtual job shadow program is, I think that they can probably find other ways to fund that program with their grant money. On top of that, that is not a program that is the purpose of an EOF fund. EOF funds, like I mentioned before, are supposed to be funds that go directly into the pockets of students. Uh, and doing a virtual job shadow is not money going directly into the pockets of students. Uh, and I would like to just keep it as we pay for the scholarship money. Uh, and we, we don't provide the services for the other programs that they are asking for. Thank you, Speaker Bevan. Representative Kirk. Yes, and to also go off of what Speaker Bevan just said, <clears throat> if they are needing this, um, this money for something complete, uh, like uh, this job shadowing or what have you, that's fine. They need to create a separate um, request form for the said thing, so it's not an EOF fund, because as the Speaker Babin just said, this is not going directly into our stu the student's pocket, so it will not be going to what they're saying this as an EOF fund would be. Representative Balaji? Uh, can I just request Gabe to uh, read those four criteria for EOF funding, please? Uh, yeah, so um, they have to meet one of the four, academic scholarships and fellowships for both graduate and undergraduate students, need-based grants, including awards to students with special expenses, such as, such as child care, or groups of students who have been historically underrepresented in higher ed, salaries or grants for students participating in public and community service programs, and salaries for students employed in campus student service programs, such as tutoring, daycare, or peer counseling. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca, Representative Balaji. Uh, I would consider the job, the virtual job uh, shadow uh, 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 program as one of the need-based for, for historically underrepresented students. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's my thought process here. Chairperson Hall. Um, while I think that sentiment is the right idea, I think at the end of the day, need-based grants and awards are for, like, to go into the student's pocket. They are paying for the seats for the job fair. They are not, which is a program, right, at the end of the day. So they're paying for the seats for the student to attend, could technically be a conference at the end of the day, to attend this space of the virtual job fair. They are not paying the student in their pocket so they can go buy food or pay for schooling. It is not, at the end of the day, going into their pockets. It's paying for a seat for them to attend a virtual job fair. So I don't think that applies to any of the four criteria. Speaker Bevan. Uh, with a point of inquiry, Gabriel, can you help us define, so that, that thing of like, when we say need-based, are we talking about like need-based scholarship based on the FAFSA? Like what, what does need-based mean? So, very good question. Um, of course, this was written before I was here. Um, I, would not if, if I would not define need-based grants as a scholarship. I would define need-based grants as right, supporting special expenses such as childcare um, or supporting students who have been historically underrepresented in higher ed. So I would see it more as this is not me as a scholarship. This is not a scholarship, this is more of providing you funding or dollars or resources um, based off of special expenses that a student um, may have or incur. Um, I, that is the best definition that I can give you based off of my knowledge of our journal. Representative Kirk. So um, clarification, this would be, <clears throat> as of what you just uh, cl uh, clarified, 
this would be something that um, resources such as uh, websites, um, materials, specific materials that they would need, or um, as we keep on saying, physical money that would go into their pockets or things like that for them to be able to use, not just a, here you can go do this and we have an option for you to do so, correct? I don't want to sway the committee, um, but I would not, I would not think that the student government could defend providing funding to services like that. But, right, I'm not the student government or to sway the committee. So my advice would be that we either vote to determine if it meets one of these four, and if not, then take up the motion that was provided by Speaker Babin so that we could at least right, ch challenge the Senate to make that determination and not us. Lauren? I don't know how much it matters like for you guys, like which it's under, if it's under EOF or student support services, I mean, it's the same application for everything. So if there are things that you want to like break out between them um, and fund them, you know, at some level on EOF and at some level on student support services, let me know and I can like just add another row. So that's an option. So to go back to what advisor Fonseca was saying, I will entertain a motion to vote to uh, see if this particular line item meets the criteria of one of the four um, requirements of scholarship. Vice President Haas. Point of inquiry, could we entertain a motion to just separate out the scholarships and the rest of the programming so we can discuss this as a separate line item under student support services later? Yeah, you can make that motion. Well, then I motion to do that. Second. All right. Seconded by Representative Balaji. Give us one second. But when we are ready, Madam Vice President, you will have the floor to speak on your motion. I just want to make sure that I'm getting this correct. And Lauren, I might need your help on this. So their scholarship piece of it is, according to what they currently have, is the 4,500 um, and the rest of it well, not really, because their request is for an increase to their scholarship line. So it would be, and I don't know if you have that number in front of you, Lauren, but whatever the difference in moving that out of this line. Is that what you're asking? It'll be $6,486. Yeah, that one. So the motion would be to separate the scholarships from the, uh, the operation expenses. Yes. Okay, and does that have a second? It was seconded by Representative Balaji. Okay, so we can go ahead and move with the debate now. Before we do that, Lauren, did you have something? I do think that the increase that they were asking for was for additional scholarships, so just for clarification as you're working through that. Yeah, so I think let's look at it from what their increase is and not what the motion that Speaker Babin made so that we can make that separation, and then we can go into the motion that Speaker Babin made on the scholarship itself so that we're still looking at this motion as well. Uh, don't we have to table my motion yes, first? Yes, you do. Thank you. We have to vote on tabling that, correct? Someone has to m move to table it first. So, retracting a motion from Vice President Haas, I will be entertaining a motion to table Speaker Babbitt's motion so we can entertain another motion if anyone wants to make it said. Motion, motion. to table Speaker Babbitt's uh, motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Kirk. Speaker Babin's motion has been tabled for the time being. You'll have to vote on it, so I'm gonna turn it on now. So we now will be voting on Vice President Haas. No, we will be voting on tabling. Yes. There it is. Voting on tabling Speaker Babin's motion. All right, we can go ahead and vote A, yes to table, B, no to table. All right, the vote is seven to one. The motion is tabled. Okay, Matt, oh, sorry. Can I motion to separate the scholarship from the operational expenses? 
Yes, you may. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Balaji. Gabe, are you caught up? No? Nope. All right. So when Gabe is caught up, Vice President Hasse, you do have the floor to speak on your motion. Uh, I think it makes a lot more sense for us to be able to to discuss this line item separately, especially after the points that Speaker Babin has made about the funding and uh, where this will go and how we consider, whether we consider it EOF or whether we consider it a student support service. And that way we can discuss strictly the scholarships at this point and the proposition that Speaker Babin made previously about $4,000 versus the 6,000 that they have now requested. So I think it makes it a lot simpler if we can just talk about scholarships and then talk about operational funding later. Chairperson Hall. I don't know if this is a point of information or inquiry, so either or. Um, I was wondering, would we be able to dictate that they could only use the EOF for scholarships and then if we awarded any money in student support services, then they could use that for and not mix it all together? Yes, if you successfully got it into your funding commitment. Representative Jackson. Am I allowed to ask a question? Okay, so if we do that for this, then wouldn't we have to go back and do that for disability support services? That is up to the committee if they choose to do so. You're not required to do so. Um, but to answer your question, no, you don't have to. Um, are there any other motion, not motions, not motions. Are there any other members wishing to speak on Vice President Haas's motion to move the or separate the um, line item? Speaker Babin. I mean, personally, I think it will be a waste of time um, because I don't think that there should be really much conversation about whether or not these programs should be fun that that we as student fees should be funding these separate programs for these groups um i'm okay with with funding scholarships for something but for something that is as well funded as these programs are when we have programs that are not well funded when we have other things that that absolutely will not happen without student fees i think that we need to prioritize those things uh, and it'll just be a waste of time for us to separate the, this from the other when we can just remove that portion in a vote on on the EOF uh, and then we don't need to talk about the the other portions at all we only have the EOF I think that that's probably the best way to do it but I understand why people would want to split it I just think it would be a waste of time Thank you, Speaker Babin, and anyone else wishing to speak on Vice President Haas's motion? Seeing none, we will now be voting on Vice President Haas's motion to separate the line item. A is to yes, separate. B is to no, separate. Also, as a point of information for everyone, a point of information means that you are providing information to the group. A point of inquiry means you are asking a question. You're welcome. Also, it's I move, not I motion. That is a personal pet peeve, but you say I move. Thank you. Sounds like she's heads the Senate. Uh, the motion is, the vote is one to seven. The motion fails. Motion fails to split the line item. Do we have to not untable, but like bring back Speaker Babin's motion or is it just here now? So technically, yes, uh, but right, mm -hmm. you're the chair, so you can pull it back up if you want. I will be. So bringing back Speaker Babin's original motion to fund, I believe, $4,500, is that correct? That was right. $4,500 for the Student Support, Pro Student Support Services Program. Um, is there anyone wishing to speak on motion? Chairperson Hall. Um, I think we're kind of a broken record right now with my same point, but still. Um, I think bringing this down to the 4,500, keep scholarships where they're at and what they're already giving out. 
Um, and then as Speaker Babin has said um, time again, um, this program is so well funded, they get $3.9 million every year. Um, that number is increasing <laughs> as we speak um, every year that they have gone up for this grant. So I think at the end of the day, the money that we are taking away, they will find other ways to provide these programs to these students um, through that <laughs> $3.9 million. Um, and as Speaker Babin has said uh, um, as well, is there's programs on here that will not function without our money. So I think we need to remember our priorities when it comes to this um, money that we are putting out. Thank you, Chairperson Hull, Vice President Haas. So I completely agree about the programming aspect of this. I just think that if we are, if we believe that scholarships are so as important as we have all been saying this whole time, that then we need to fund the full 6,000 that they have requested to give in scholarships because that is money that is going directly to students' pockets. That's what EOF is for. And I think if they're requesting that, they're going to be able to give a lot more students the funding um, that they have previously given before. And that increase, I, I don't know, I think it's worth it. Thank you, Vice President Haas. Speaker Babin. I just want to reiterate that part of the reason I think it is perfectly okay for us to do this is because these programs provide phenomenal services to students already, and they do not need our funds to provide the phenomenal service they are already providing. And I just want to throw it out there that I think they are doing a great job, and that is why I think it's okay to do this. I'm not saying that they are doing a bad job, that they provide unnecessary services. I'm saying they do a great job and that they don't need this extra funding to do the amazing job they do. Thank you, Speaker Bevan. Is anyone else wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Representative Moika. Would uh, Speaker Bevan entertain an increase of 500? To so we, oh. to f so it will be like a total of 5,000 rather than 4,500. So in order to do that, Speaker Babin will have to retract her original motion, and then we have to bring in a new motion to um, fund $5,000, since you can't make a friendly amendment on a motion. Um, but if Speaker Babin wants to retract her motion, she can do so. Um, but yeah, is anyone else wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Seeing none, we will be voting on funding the Student Support Services Program, $4,500. Um, you may now vote. We're still missing one person. All right, there we go. Uh, the vote is seven to one. The motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Madam Clerk, we're ready to proceed. Line item number 19 is the non-traditional student scholarship. They requested $25,000, which is $1.04 per student. They are located on page 229 of the fees binder. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there a motion on the line item? Chairperson, Representative Kirk, sorry. Yes, I uh, motion. Yes, I motion to. I move. I move to adopt the full twenty-five thousand that is allocated in the non-traditional scholarship fund. Is there a second? Second. Second. Seconded by Speaker Babin. Oh, I'm, it, I just heard it from over here and just guessing because I can't see. But it's seconded by Representative Martin, not Babin. Representative Kirk, it is your motion, so you may speak on it first. This scholarship helped me get back into school. Um, I am a non-traditional student, and I feel like sometimes they are, uh, the non-traditional students are sometimes forgotten, not by money, but by just people in general sometimes. So um, I would re really encourage everyone to think about that as we go into voting on this. Thank you, Representative Kirk. Is anyone else wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Seeing none, we will go into the vote. 
um, voting to fully fund the non-traditional student scholarship at $25,000. You may now vote. The vote is eight to zero. The motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Madam Clerk, we're ready to proceed. Line item number 20 is the ADHD slash learning disability assessment scholarship fund. They requested $450, which is 0 0.02 cents per, or two cents per person, and I'll locate on page 108 of the fees binder. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there, is there a motion on the line item? Representative Martin. Um, I move to fund them the full 450. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Kirk. Representative Martin, it is your motion. You have the floor. Um, yeah, you guys heard me talk about it all the time. I'll say it for the 900th time. Students with learning disabilities are extremely important to me. And as somebody who is going to be needing this scholarship in the near future, I think it's extremely important that we fund this one. Thank you, Representative Martin. Is anyone else wishing to speak on a motion? Representative Dobbin. Uh, I just want to say that I love this scholarship. I think that this is an incredibly important service that we provide to students to allow them to have um, the opportunity for this kind of testing on our campus at, at a cheaper rate or a, an, a free rate, I think is incredibly, incredibly important. And I wish that we had more scholarships like this um, that provide this kind of medical mental health service uh, to our students. So absolutely 100% we should fund this this program. Thank you, Speaker Babin. Is anyone else wishing to speak on the motion? Seeing none, we will be voting on the line item to fully fund the ADHD LD assessment scholarship at $450. We are still missing two people. All right, the vote is eight to zero. The motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Clerk Fox, we're ready to proceed. Line item number 21 is the International Scholarship Fund. They requested $10,000, which is 42 cents per student. They are located on page 39 of the fees binder. Is there a motion on the line item at hand? Chairperson Hall. I move that we fund the full $10,000 for the International Scholarship Fund. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Moika. Chairperson Hull, it was your motion, so you have the floor. Yes. Um, with the scholarship fund, um, it's a, a bridge gapper between students who wouldn't ordinarily get the opportunity um, to study abroad, which is such a valuable opportunity going into a world that everything is connected at this point. Um, so getting that separate experience um, in another country um, really helps students um, create their full world picture and are more marketable to employers. So. Thank you, Chairperson Hall. See anyone else wishes to speak on the motion at hand? Representative Balaji. Uh, I'd like to uh, inform the committee that they already have a $10,000 from previous year, which they have not used, and another $5,200 from financial year 20. And I was supposed to go to, a, uh, to an internship in Germany this summer, and it got canceled because the travel restrictions are still in place. And I do understand that uh, the vaccines are in a rollout and the whole world is getting inoculated soon, but I don't, I mean, I don't foresee, at least at this point, knowing what we know, that the uh, international travel is going to open up this summer at least. I mean, I do understand that it might come back and fall. So uh, I would like, I, I'd like to uh, request the committee to, to not fund this right now and ha they still have $15,000 at their disposal for next year. That's almost 50% more than what they requested. Thank you, Representative Palaji. Representative Kirk. Yes, to um, answer, uh, well, to 
give some information uh, about what you have just been talking about. Um, my, I have been given the opportunity to be able to go to Russia um, and back to Kazakhstan from where I stayed for a while to do some more studying, to music related stuff. Anyway, um, it is on delay right now. However, that money has been allocated to me. So it's in words spoken for. So it's there, but technically not there. Thank you, Representative Kirk. Speaker Babin. Yeah, I, I also wanted to ad address what you said, because I think it's a really valid concern and, and a concern that I had as well. But I believe that the best option for the International Scholarship Fund is for us to fully fund it this year. Um, because all of this money starts being used in the fall. So the summer is already covered by, by what they have uh, in the past. Um, so, and there, I fully believe that there is potential for international travel, uh, if not in the fall, at least in the next spring semester, which this scholarship would cover as well. But we have the option to sweep their reserves, which I'm not gonna lie, that is a motion I will make to sweep their reserves, give them the 10,000 they have, um, and we will sweep that reserves into our, you know, 1% or whatever, 1% that we have to already. So I believe that the best option for, for this line in particular is to uh, award them the full funding for this year and then sweep their reserves at the end. Thank you, Speaker Babin. Representative Balaji. Yeah, I think I can agree with that. Uh, I mean, I, I remember Gabe was telling us that it's better to fund them and then sweep rather than not fund them. So, yeah. Thank you, Representative Balaji. Is anyone else wishing to speak on the line item at hand? Seeing none, we will move to vote to fully fund the International Scholarship Fund for Study Abroad at $10,000. You may now vote. Do not vote yet. Now you can vote. The vote is eight to zero. The motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Madam Clerk, we're ready to proceed. Line item number 22 is the WSU Student of the Year Scholarship Competition. They requested $8,000, which is 33 cents per student. You can find them on page 243 of the fees binder. Uh, before I entertain any motions, I do have a question for you. Advisor Fonseca, do we have to vote to um, adopt the entire EOF budget before we move on to student support services? Um, no, so we'll do those chunk ones. That's part of the last vote cycle that we'll do. Since this is just our drafty draft, we don't have to go over the whole areas. Got you, so we'll vote on it by chunks tomorrow. That is correct. <laughs> Yeah, I should check that, sorry. Yes, we'll do the whole, va uh, the whole vote tomorrow. Thank you for that. Um, moving back in. Oh, um, are there any motions for the line out of my hand? Speaker Babin. Uh, I move to uh, adopt the WSU Student of the Year Scholarship Competition at $2,430, their, their amount from fiscal year 21. Is there a second? Second. Second by Representative Balaji. Speaker. What, could you repeat that number? Uh, it's 2,430. It's their amount from fiscal year 21. Um, Speaker Babin, it is your motion. You have the floor. I know I keep saying that I love scholarships, and I, and I do, but my concern with this scholarship is that the WSU Student of the Year Scholarship Competition is continually, continually run, won by older students. Uh, so students who are seniors who have received 60 credit hours or more who will not be staying at the university, and quite frequently it's won by people who are graduating within a semester. 
Uh, so they, while the money is appreciated, I think that we could use this money better. Uh, so to keep their scholarships at what it was last year, uh, I think is, is a great thing. They will still be able to provide some great scholarships to students with that $2,000. Uh, I just don't think that the $8,000 request that they've given uh, was well enough um, justified uh, in their reasoning and their breakdown of how they give it out. Um, yeah, I think that's enough. Thank you, Speaker Babin. Is anyone else wishing to speak on the motion? Representative Pelosi. I'd also like to point out that they are requesting an increase to fund the graduate scholarships, which was initially funded from reserves from SI. Uh, and uh, when I go to SI, I see that they have given $155,000 to student affairs. So what I'm trying to say is they do have enough money to fund their graduate scholarships from their reserves and through interdepartmental uh, uh, transfers, I guess. So uh, yeah, that's why I support the 2,430. Thank you, Representative Balaji. Is anyone else wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Seeing none, we will vote to fund the WSU Student of the Year Scholarship competition at $2,430. You may now vote. That was a fast one. Uh, the vote is eight to zero, the motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Madam, Madam Clerk, we're ready to proceed. Line item number 25 is student involvement. They requested $956,459, which is $39.84 per student. You can find them on page 233 of the fees binder. All right, moving into student support services. Um, is there a motion on the line item at hand? Point of inquiry, we're on student involvement, is that correct? Okay, I got confused with what you just said, so thanks. I meant like the next chunk, my bad. If I confused anyone, I realize it's very confusing. Um, Representative Balaji, you have a motion? Uh, I move to accept the budget of uh, $956,459 in full. Is there a second? Seeing none, I will entertain a new motion. If anyone has one. Speaker Babin. I'm gonna do math really quick. Uh, so can you see if somebody else has a motion and then come back to me? I apologize. Representative Martin, did you have a motion? Yeah. All right, does anyone else have a motion on the line item? Yes, sorry. Speaker Babbitt did the math. Let's hear the motion. Uh, okay, so I move to adopt the student involvement budget at 931459 which is $38.81 per student. Is there a second? Second. Who seconded? I didn't see Don anything. Kirk. Representative Kirk with the second. Um, Speaker Babbitt, it is your motion, so you may proceed. Uh, so this is a cut of $25,000, which I believe is uh, a, de a pretty decent chunk of money to uh, ensure that some of the, that all of the positions that are in uh, student involvement are fully funded um, and that all of the, that a good a chunk of the programs are being funded, but that we're still um, cutting at least some of the, the programming that is less fully essential. So I think that a $25,000 cut is a, obviously a decent chunk of change, but I think that um, it's enough for us to reach our goal while still funding the essential functions of student involvement. Just for my knowledge, Speaker Babin, the number was $931,459, right? Yeah. All right, good. I did the math right. Um, Anyone else wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Representative Balaji? Uh, looking at the budget proposal, I mean, they have made some cuts already in their, in their unclassified salaries and other, other places, and they tried to maintain the same level of funding as last year. And 
we just took, I mean, we kind of took away uh, uh, some money from the reserves for the graduate scholarships, which they're going to do for the WSC student of the year. Uh, so we might not, we might look at the fact that they all, they've already done their cuts to maintain their budget level. So that requires, I mean, that, that, that's a good step from them. So I don't think we should just hammer them with more cuts this year. Representative Kirk. Please someone correct me if I am wrong, but in, <clears throat> in fiscal year 2020, um, they got 1,013,836. Then last year when student fees met, we decided for 9,956,459. So them coming, uh, they were wanting to come over to bring over the same amount of money it was pointed out that uh, they already made cuts in other areas. Um, I believe this is where someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that they made cuts in other areas to be able to make up for um, the significant loss that they had made from fiscal year 2020 to fiscal year 2021 um, within that. Now, to reiterate what uh, Speaker Babin is saying, what this cut is intentionalizing is so that they can, this money goes directly towards salaries and cannot, we will not tell them what to and to not do with their money, but our intention is so that we know that the money, we can hope that the money can go towards salaries and not towards other uh, uh, programming and so on and so forth like that. Dr. Hall. So in the four years that I've been here, the student involvement budget has gone down just about every year that, that I've been here. And um, I, I think that they've done their best to come in flat from where they were actually from a, a decrease that they had last year. Part of their goal is to be able to hire graduate assistants to be able to um, increase the level of interaction and engagement they can have with students. I'd like to offer a friendly compromise of if we keep them where they are, we could cut $15,000 from student affairs retention and assessment that she had increased her budget to include some student assistance that I think that she could fund those positions out of reserve. So it's not quite 25,000, but it's at least $15,000 toward the, the total that we need to get to. Dr. Hall, point of inquiry for you. Uh, it, based on what, what I have here, it looks like their budget has was increased steadily and fairly significantly uh, until fiscal year 20. Is that, in, is that not correct? Because it looks like student involvement budget has increased until 20 and then they only received a reduction last year. I don't have those numbers in front of me. Oh. I don't have those numbers in front of me. Uh, if you look at the sheet with the, all the budgets What's, from What the page past, number? Um, Two? It's like Roman numeral one. It's like the very first. It's also on the screen. That's correct. So that is correct, that their budget did steadily grow, but it was cut in 2021 to lower than what it was in 2018. So. I would assert, though, if you look at the, the kind of increases, though, those were probably um, benefits and some kind of salary increases. They weren't necessarily programmatic increases of, of large chunks. I mean, I think when you look at taking them back to three, three fiscal years ahead of, you know, years back is a fairly significant cut last year. So, you know, you folks are going to do what you're going to do, but I... I, I feel like that we've been crippling the student involvement office from trying to do new things and trying to increase engagement on campus. We keep cutting them and yet we want them to still engage students and I'm just not sure it's possible for them. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Is anyone, wish, anyone else wishing to speak on the line item at hand? All right, seeing none, we will be voting on 
Can we pause before voting for a second? Just can we get like two minutes to think about the proposed that what uh, Dr. Hall just said? I want I would like the chance to think about that before we or, vote. If or that's or okay. you could or we could take 15 from um, the student affairs assessment and retention, and then you take 10 from student involvement if you want to get to 25. With me, Mr. Chairman, I would advise we recess for five minutes. We're going to do that. We're going to recess for five minutes. It is 3.03. .03. We will call back to order at 3.08.
I call session of student fees back to order. It's the opinion of the chair that all members are present. Moving back into the deliberations on the line item of student involvement, there was a motion on the floor to fund $93,459. Um, Oh, it looks like 93 right here because the, the like screen is like cutting it off. My bad. There, go. there you go. 931,000, it's, it's a little different. 931,459 dollars. Um, that is the motion that is on the table right now. So are there any other comments or speeches from the committee? Speaker Bowden. Uh, I have a point of inquiry for, for Dr. Hall that I would like just some more context on this. So. Um, this is more context for this en entire process. So it seems that quite frequently, a lot of these, there are positions that are funded partially through student fees and partially through general use dollars. And general use dollars are getting cut and then portions of those salaries are then pushed on to student fees and we're essentially required to do them because obviously we don't wanna fire people, that's not part of what we do. So is there, an effort or could there be an effort from the administration to avoid those kinds of cuts to salaries from pushing them on to, stu to student fees? Because that's not really the intended purpose of student fees, uh, especially when they're doing more administrative work that isn't necessarily directly involved in providing student services. My friend, uh, Mr. Miller will help me with this, but... Um... I don't know why Danielle Johnson's calling me. Um, philosophically, I, I think that it's appropriate for student service areas to be funded through student fees because predominantly that's what we do, right? And the challenge is that all of that money can't just go to programmatic things. They're gonna have to go to the staffing that then helps provide the services. Um, I wish I could say that there's gonna be more GU money coming in, because there are some functions that are paid for by student fees that I wish they were paid for by GU dollars, but the likelihood of them coming are not, it's not gonna happen. So it, then it comes down to if those services are gonna take place at all, where's the funding going to come for them? Um, we are, we're gonna have experience a, a cut in GU funding this semester and to eliminate the, the, the pain on departments and to not cut services, I actually eliminated the executive assistant position in my office, saving $65,000 that then wouldn't have to be cut from departments. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I am doing all that I can to minimize the impact of university cuts in all areas that, that, that will affect students and doing all that I can to make sure that we keep student fees as low as we possibly can. So as, as a follow-up question to that, and I you know, appreciate the, the work that you do in that, in that area, but it, it seems, and again, outside perspective, I don't get to be in any of the conversations about general use dollars, but it seems that some of the, and maybe it, this is just not true, but it seems like a lot of times that, let me try and reword what I'm gonna say because I think I can say it better. So basically, I would rather fund the services themselves that might be being cut than the salaries. Mm. So like, I guess that's, that's, my, that's my perspective and my concern is that I think that it would be better for student fees to fund the actual services that might be essentially being cut, but it seems that we're often given the salaries instead. Is that, is that a correct perspective well, or, or an, I just would like, I guess like to hear your thoughts on that sort of perspective. Well, I don't know how we, we separate services from salaries. You know, when we talk about counseling, you can't have counseling without counselors, right? And so we can't have programming or we can't have turning through life without someone to run that. So for me, it's, it's all bound up together and because um, you just can't say it's, it, we're only going to pay for this because without the people, we can't have the program. And so um, 
I would also say that if you look at how um, some of the salaries that our student affairs folks are paid, they're woefully low. If you look at our master's levels coordinators in student involvement in other places, they're paid less than entry level teachers in USD 259 with master's degrees. So that upsets me, it makes me very upset, but I don't know what, how to fix that. And then you're gonna say to me, but Dr. Hall, that means that student fees are gonna have to go up to make those, those positions be equitable with the city, right? Um, it's, it is very common to have student, student fees cover student service areas. And it's just, you know, I don't know what David wants to add to this, this dialogue. Um, he's responsible for all the GU cuts that then we have to move into student fees. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome, sir. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm not sure if my comment is very of much value, but on the GU side of the budget, about 70% of the budget is personnel. We're a personnel intensive organization and the product we deliver requires personnel dollars. And so I think the challenge is when the budgets are being reallocated, it doesn't leave much to reallocate except for the personnel side. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that, Dr. Hall and David Miller. Are there any other um, members wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Representative Balaji. After thinking about this a little, uh, a little, I, I <clears throat> what I think would be a good compromise would be to, if we do, cut this uh, uh, amount by twenty five thousand dollars, then we, then we uh, make sure that we don't sweep their reserves, which is a quite sizable amount. But uh, and we would be uh, interested to do that. But I think if 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 we are able to compromise on the fact that we won't sweep from them, or I don't know how we go about that, but. Uh, and, and, and also, we just made a bunch of, I mean, not, I shouldn't say bunch, I'm sorry. We just made a cut with respect to a student tutor. We made a cut with respect to uh, the, uh, the online job search thing. And I understand these are well-funded programs, but then we don't know whether they're going to get the fund or not. We just go by the fact that they, may, they might get it. So we are already making cuts to services and personal, which, and so I, I I want to make sure that that we are not doing we are not over stressing these cuts and and I'm making sure that we don't sweep uh, the monies from SI so that they at least can stay afloat. It's, I mean they have gone to great lengths to make sure that the budget is balanced. I mean they are not increase they are not increasing the budget amount, and that take, that takes a lot of work considering that your your inflation everything goes up. So uh, I, yeah, that's that. These are my thoughts which are going on, and I think a, a good compromise would be. We make these cuts, but we don't sweep from them. Um, before I go to the next speaker, I will ask Advisor Fonseca, I know we do have 30 minutes per line item. How are we looking on time? You got six minutes left. Six minutes left. So I will entertain, before I go to Dr. Hall, we'll entertain a motion to extend the time by 10 minutes. Chairperson Devin. Hall, I was looking at both of you at the same time. If you both touch your hands up. Close. Um, I move to extend this line item by 10 minutes. So with no uh, objections, I will extend the line item by 10 minutes. Dr. Hall, you may not have I, I'd like to point out that student involvement does not have $300,000 in their reserves at this point in time. They transferred $200,000 to the centralized divisional account this summer and that's part of the reason why Student Affairs did not have a $92,000 request coming forward. So that was part of the deal, that um, rather than asking for um, money from student fees, we would, we would try to survive off of uh, the carry forward from you know, the money that wasn't used as opposed to asking for new money. And so I'd ask you not to look at their reserves as, as an option. And, because um, they just don't. They need the money that sits there to renew their, the shopper sink contract that's going to be coming up that's going to be seventy-five to $80,000. And so their reserves are going to be very depleted by the time you see their, their account next year. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Does anyone else wish to speak on the motion at hand? Rep yeah, Speaker Bevan. Um, I will ask the chair if this is a possibility. So I would like to... Um, essentially entertain a vote to 
uh, rescind the motion uh, and with the understanding that if we rescind this motion, the next motion will be Dr. Hall's uh, proposal to cut 10, 10,000 from student involvement and 15,000 from student affairs assessment and retention. Um, I want to do it that way because I think that it's important that we have this conversation, like the full conversation with everyone. So I don't want to just pull my pull my motion and force that on everyone if, if other people feel that they would like this. Um, so I want to start with that. If, is that possible? Is that a thing that I can do? Sorry. I <laughs> was really long. Yeah, let's break that down a little bit. Okay, so taking student involvement, or your original motion, mm -hmm. vote to rescind, the same yes. vote would, would automatically take 10,000 from student involvement and 15,000 from student affairs assessment and retention. No. No. Uh, I'm saying that we would vote to rescind my motion with the understanding that the next motion will be Dr. Hall's proposal. So I'm saying that like I that we would still have the opportunity to vote on the the second proposal, but I all, I want us to have like I just want it to be a full conversation of whether or not we rescind the first motion. Yeah, okay. So I would recommend we take this so the motion would be that you would the current motion is you're rescinding your original motion, force the vote on that, and then immediately jump into the motion that was presented by Dr. Hall, uh, and that be the next discussion point we have. Yes. Okay. So yes, basically just do a, a, a move to rescind and take up the recommendation by Dr. Hall. That's the motion. Then I move to rescind my previous motion and move into the uh, proposal given by Dr. Hall. Um, before we do that, Gabe, I know it says in the bylaws that we have to go line item by line item. Um, by doing the proposal that um, Dr. Hall had made, we would still need to go to um, that line item and still vote on reducting $10,000, correct? Uh, no, so you can, because the, more, the, the mo motion, the motion is going to, right, because you're allowed to suspend the rules, and so the motion would allow you to not do line item by line item and jump into the section that should the motion can, uh, be successful, allows you to do that. So you, don't, you wouldn't have to move to student health next if the motion is successful. Got you. So going back, we will be, is there a second to Speaker Babbitt's motion to rescind her previous motion and move into the proposal that Dr. Hall had gave? Second. second. You can choose who you want. It's seconded by everyone. Um, so we will now, Speaker Babin, it was your motion. You may speak on the rescinding of your original motion. Uh, so uh, I think that I, well, one, I wanted to have the, the conversation about the, the funding of positions. I think that that's really important. And it's, it, is a, it is something that is exemplified in the student involvement budget of, of that occurring. Um, and so I just wanted to have that, that conversation here. And I think that, that Dr. Hall has provided a, a good solution to still allow us to make the $25,000 cut, um, but split it across areas. Uh, and I did ask her during our, our break uh, whether or not student affairs, because they are adopting this budget for two years, uh, whether or not they could take that $15,000 cut for two years. Because um, I do think the care team is an important uh, function of the university. Um, and so in having that conversation, I think that this is, it is a fair um, proposal that she has made, though it is, is not my first choice. Um, I think that in order to, to meet the needs of uh, the departments that, that Dr. Hall does know better than anyone else here, that that, that is okay. Um, so yeah, basically I'm saying that I'm, I'm okay with it, um, but again, it's, it's not my first choice of how we would do this, but I think it would be okay. Thank you, Speaker Babin. Is anyone else wishing to speak on the motion to rescind the original motion? Seeing none, we will go into the vote to rescind the original emotion, emotion, original motion. Um, so yeah, go ahead and vote A is yes to remove the, the motion 
B is to keep the motion. The vote is eight to zero, the motion carries. So it, it, I think that's the correct number because Yeah, that was right, right? 10,000 from SI, 15 from, okay, yeah. So that number is, is, so now we move into, yeah, okay. Yeah, so now you would actually need to then vote to confirm that number. Okay. Because all we did was just eliminate Speaker Babin's motion. However, right, it's with the understanding that now we're looking at the 10,000, so that's now the motion on the table, is to allocate 946, which is a reduction of 10K. So do you hop into the vote or do we go to speak about the $10,000 reduction? Say it again? Do we go straight into the vote or do we talk about the $10,000 reduction as well? Uh, you can talk about it if you want, yeah. Oh yeah, so. Is there any member wishing to speak on the um, line out of my hand? Clerk thought. Can you just repeat the full motion one more time? Yeah, the current motion is to allocate $946,459, a reduction of $10,000 to student involvement. So, is any member wishing to speak on the motion at hand? All right, seeing none, we will begin the vote to allocate $946,000, $946, thousand four hundred fifty nine dollars to student involvement a is yes b is no the vote is seven to one the motion carries moving directly into line item 32 student affairs assessment and retention um, the motion is to fund one hundred two thousand. Yeah. So the current motion is to allocate one hundred twelve thousand seven hundred eighty-five dollars, a reduction of fifteen thousand to student affairs assessment and retention. My bad. I thought that was the number that was requested. I didn't even look at the other one. That's the correct number. Okay. So, um, any member wish to speak on the? One hundred twelve thousand seven hundred eighty-five dollar um, assess or request to student affairs assessment retention. Seeing none, we will go into the vote. Uh, we will be voting on giving one hundred twelve seven hundred eighty-five one hundred twelve thousand seven hundred eighty-five dollars to student affairs assessment retention. A is yes, B is no. And just for clarification, Lauren, how much is that per student? I think it's 451, but because it's not balanced, uh, it might not be exact. There could be some variation. Do you want me to find out what it is for sure? I'll play with some numbers. We're still missing one person. There we go. The vote is eight to zero. The motion carries. If you want, Lauren, we can find that out later. I just wanted to um, keep up with what we were doing with the student, like per student uh, allocation. But you can just save that for later. We can continue. I'll have it. Four dollars and seventy cents. Sounds good. All right, so the motion did pass. Um, so moving back into the cycle, um, Clerk Fox, are ready to proceed? Line number 26 is student health. They requested $1,065,000, which is $44.37 per student. You can find their information on page 211 of the fees binder. Sorry, my number was different for some reason. Um, is there a motion on the line item at hand? Chairperson Hall. 
I move that we adopt um, the student health request to pay for the doctor funding 50% in year A and then the other 50% in year B. I can get the math really quick. When you say year A, do you mean this year or the next year? This year. Okay, this year. Okay. So, is there a second on the motion? That's a second. Sorry, I have a second. That was weird. I apologize. I have the number. Uh, Speaker Babin with the second. And before I go to Dr. Hall, I would like Chairperson Hall to read the number. I'm pretty sure it is 972,500. I don't think that's right. I think, so you're, you're taking their $1.06 million, you're subtracting 66419 from it. No, to, I did the $185,000 for the doctor because that was listed in there. They're requesting 132839 for the okay. doctor. We'll just turn it over to Dr. Hall really fast. So th this is kind of complicated because um, if they get half a funding for a doctor, that means they won't be able to search for a doctor unless that person can, won't be able to start until January. So that's, so that's what they could do. However, we can't go a semester without a doctor at Student Health, so they'd have to continue Dr. Keller's contract for a period of time for the fall and to, without, so we wouldn't have a doctor. So the real difference is like $58,000 that we would save by doing that. That's the math that, I, that Camille did for me. So it's not, it, so it's not just as simple as half the doctor because we, we still have one doctor we need to keep on call. So Dr. Hall, make sure, my brain makes sure this works because Student Health currently already pays for that doctor, so the increase that they'd be looking for would to make that to make Dr. Keller that yeah. position full time. Right. But because they already have a portion of it, the the half of it's different. Right. Okay. Because if, if you look in our math, this that currently he makes like sixty six thousand dollars or so with this forty percent contract. They want they need one hundred and eighty five hundred ninety to do a full time doctor. So so we still need a doctor until we can hire a full time doctor. Can you repeat that number that Camille did, the math? So her math was that she's, let me read what she said. Uh, so half of the pros, um, 185 is 92,500. We could plan on starting a search in, in, Mer in, in late fall with the plan start of 1-1-22. Then, then the half salary would cover the rest. Da -da -da. Um, but there would need to be an adjustment to temp salary to cover a half year of Dr. Keller through December 21. That would add 34,500 back into the budget. If my math is is right, that's a $58,000 difference. Point of inquiry. Uh, Dr. Hall, um, so the House just passed the new CARES Act. Um, and it's my understanding that that includes money for college student health organizations. Um, would there be f funding from that that could cover the half of the doctor that we wouldn't be paying for this year? Because obviously this, this, it's one-time money. Um, so would it cover that now and then the next year? So yeah, they would still true. be able to hire this year, and but the next year they would get the full funding to continue having that doctor. Is that, is that, I'm um, sure, trying me, to understand what the CARES Act can, money can be Can we for. table this until I can get some more information? Before we do that, I would like to turn it over to Lauren. I just have a quick note on the like escalator thing. Um, so if you say, okay, this year, you know, we're not gonna fund this, but next year we will, just keep in mind that you're tying the hands of the future committee to either have to do an increase or cut something else to fund that. Um, so just keep that in mind as you guys do your discussions. All right, thank you for that, Lauren. Is there any other member wishing to speak at this time? Speaker Babin. Uh, with a motion, I would like to table this discussion until we can get more information about CARES Act funding for student health. Is there a second? Second by Senator Representative Moika. Um, 
Speaker Babin, it is your motion, so you have the floor. Yeah, I just think that it's hard for us to have conversations about the full student health budget without understanding that, ex not, and I understand we probably won't be able to get a total dollar number, because I think it has to go through the Kansas Board of Regents or something like that, so, but to at least have an estimate of, of how much they will get, um, so that there is, we can look at what potential there is for this year, and what we could cover, not cover, that would still be okay, because um, I obviously think that it's important that we do have a doctor on campus, um, but I want to make sure that we fund this in a way that makes sense. Uh, and I want us to have all the information before we move forward with discussions, because I just don't really think it's fair for us to, to make assumptions or discussions without actually having the full knowledge of, of potential one-time funding they'll get from the government. So anyone else wish you to speak, Dr. Hall? And what I will also do is see what kind of funding we've gotten in this fiscal year to see what kind of relief we've gotten. So I'll, I'll get as much as I can for you to, for tomorrow. Representative Balaji. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, is that representative referring to the CARES Act or the American Rescue Plan? The one that passed today. That's American Rescue Plan. Thank you. I don't know the names, but <laughs> yeah, they, basically they passed more money today that should be coming soon to the university. Uh, Representative Balaji? Just to make sure that uh, uh, in the translation we don't look at CARES Act funding or something, I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that it's American Rescue Plan and not CARES Act. Thank you. Thank you for that. And without objection, um, we will be tabling the discussion on student health, line item number 26. Um, Representative Kirk. Just with the motion, uh, I need a quick recess for like two, three minutes. All right, without objection, we will recess for five minutes.
all student fees back to order. Um, we are on the line item number 25, nope, number 26, student health. Um, on the table, on the motion to fund one million thirty thousand dollars. Chairperson Hall. Um, I move for year A, aka this year. Um, we fund one million three thousand dollars, and then in year B, we increase that to one million sixty-five thousand dollars. Three, sorry. Three. Is there a second? Second. Second by Speaker Babin. From the math. I yeah, because we're only subtracting 35,000 from this year. Oh, yes, sorry, I forgot a zero. You're good. So I'm just gonna. I will re say, okay, ready. Yeah. $1,030,000 for this year in year A. Year B would be $1,065,000 for year B. Is there a second? Second. Second by Speaker Babin. Um, Chairperson Hold, is your motion? You have the floor. Yes, so I think this process would pay for Dr. Keller to continue um, until fall, until they can find a doctor in order to fill um, for the springtime, so um, they would be able to pay for the doctor in the spring, their salary, and then um, year B, they would be able to have a fully funded doctor that would continue full time. Correct me if I'm wrong, Doctor. I would just, oh, I'm sorry. May I speak? Yeah, yeah, for Um I don't know that that, it could be that they, they are able to hire a doctor at three quarter time, so I don't know that, it, that we don't think we need to worry about when Dr. Keller comes or goes or when the new doctor starts, this allows them to be able to have full doctor coverage through the rest of the time. Yes, I was just trying to give a justification of mm. the number okay. ideas. Okay. And in a perfect world, this yep. is what would happen. Yep. Uh, continuing, on, continuing on with um, statements on the motion, Speaker Babin, you have the floor. Yeah, so I just kind of want to let everyone in on some conversations that we had during the break, just as some further clarifications on the uh, money that will be coming in from the, the thing that just passed through the United States House. Um, I don't remember what it's called, so we're going to go with that. Um, basically, we have no idea what that amount of money is going to be and we won't know what that money is going to be until you know a couple months from now uh, and there's also no guarantee that that money will go directly to student health it could also go to counseling and prevention services so there's there's a lot of leeway with where that money could go how much money that could be so it isn't i guess wise for us to make determinations based on that amount or any guess of what that amount is. So I think that this is a good way for us to, to fund the, the doctor position that is incredibly important and, and necessary for um, something that, it's something that we need on campus. And I want us to be able to, to fund it, understanding that they ha did ask for a huge increase this year to fund it. And so this allows us to, to fund it incrementally so that we're not charging students as much this year, understanding that next year it will be charged. Uh, and we are putting next year's group into a bind, forcing them to do this, but funding a doctor is something that I think is incredibly important and I will put my eggs in this, ba this basket anyway, um, that, that this should absolutely happen. So uh, I will obviously be voting in favor of this. Any other members wishing to speak on the motion of hand, sort of the representative Bal uh, I just have a quick question. If, if somebody can clarify how we came to 130, uh, I mean, the, sorry, 1030, I mean, 1 million 30,000. And I also want us to, want everyone to know that we are, I mean, Dr. Keller expressed that he wanted to retire. We are forcing him to come back for another semester, I understand. Or that's what the student health services was telling me that he wanted to retire. He did want to retire. Yeah. So, I mean, 
Um, Dr. Hall. Yeah. This, this compromise would allow um, the student health department to look at hiring a, a doctor at 80% time versus full time, or um, it, it, it allows Dr. Keller to retire and then, to, then move forward with the search this summer or early fall for, for the full time doctor. Just to be clear, I'm not opposing that. I'm just no, it's, it's all good. That. It, uh, it all works. Yeah, and, 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 and if somebody can provide me like how exactly that 1,030,000 came about, like what did we cut, what did we add, just to make sure, just for clarification. Chairperson Hall, was your motion, so I'll let you answer that. Yes, so $33,000, or sorry, $66,000 already exists in the budget for Dr. Keller's salary. For like right for him to be a doctor half time, or 40%, right? Yes, 40%. Um, and then adding the 92500 which is half of the doctor's salary um, that they're expecting to pay of the one, um, 185000 So if we add those numbers together and then add it to the overall uh, previous request, that is where we get that number at. So we're subtracting the 35000 that um, we're not paying for the doctor at the moment, right? Um, and that's where we get the $1,030,000 at. So then the next year's group will have to increase the budget to that. Advisor Fonseca. Let me add a, make it a little bit easier. The doctor is $185,000. We're gonna give 150 to that, 33,500 will be held back until next year. So that's reduced 30, by $35,000 $35, and we're gonna pay for $150,000 to that $185,000 doctor. Student Health has a portion of it already, we're giving them the other portion and then committing in the next year to provide them with the, 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 the gap that's still missing. Hopefully it's a little easier. Just a point of clarification. So uh, they did say that if we do not fund, if we do not fund the doctor, that they have to add 69,000 for Dr. Keller. So it's what? So I wouldn't consider anything about Dr. Keller. We are just looking at the doctor. So we are, the, the, to hire a new doctor, it would cost us $185,000 to do so. We are committing to giving 150 of that 185, and they, and they will have to make up the difference for year A, for, for, next, for the next upcoming fiscal year. The fiscal year after that, we will commit the other portion so that they will have the funding to hire a full doctor. How student health figures out who to hire gives them the flexibility to decide whether it's Dr. Keller or someone else, whoever they want to do that. So while we've been saying the name Dr. Keller, I don't want us to focus on that person because that's not necessarily what's going to happen. This amount gives them the flexibility to determine whatever options they need in order to ensure that a doctor is hired for students in this next year. Okay, uh, let me just rephrase it. So we are giving them $150,000 to either hire another doctor or keep the current one. And then, I mean, because I, I mean, for me it looks, they, do they, are they funding Dr. I mean, in this budget, do they have funding for Dr. Keller? Mm -hmm. They do? Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Hall, you have something to add? So the last thing I'll say is the nice thing about that amount is it means that they could postpone and not and not have the doctor start until August 15th, for example. And that could make up some of that difference that we're talking about. And so the doctor could start before school starts. We don't necessarily need a doctor in the summertime. Our patients are down. I just want you to know that Camille Childers is a great director of student health. She will figure out a way to make this work. We will continue to have the kind of health care that we need for students on campus. But she, she's, she's, she's amazing. She'll make it work. Thank you, Dr. Hall. If I could have you mute, mute your mic. Yep. Thank you. Um, so moving on, is there any other member wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Seeing none, we will move into the voting period. We'll be voting to allocate $1,030,000 to student health. A is for yes, B is for no. The vote is eight to zero, the motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Moving into the next line item. Madam Clerk, we're ready to proceed. Line number two. Line item number 27 is Child Development Center Assistant Teacher Program. They requested $294,091, which is $12.25 per student. Um, they are found on page one of the fees binder. Sorry. 
Sorry, I was updating my numbers. Um, is there a motion on the line item? Representative Speaker Babin. I move to allocate $294,091 with $25,000 to exist in a scholarship fund oversee overseen by the CDC Advisory Board with the expectation that the CDC will return in the next fiscal year to review the $50,000 sliding scale and services for students. That was a very large motion. Um, would you like to, before I ask for a second, would you like to explain Yeah, I can explain that better. So basically, I'm saying that we will get, their whole budget will exist and they will get all of this money. But $25,000 of this normally would go towards a sliding fee scale for students. What we want to do is take that $25,000 and say that it is the Student Government Association CDC Advisory Board that will give that money out. Does that make sense? So, so all of that money will still be used and eventually given to the CDC, just not until we have the students who apply for this program and give them that scholarship in that way. So a lot of this is what will go into their contract, um, but I want, the understanding of the committee to be that we are going to directly control how this $25,000 is given to the student. Not we, the CDC advisory board will directly control how that $25,000 is given out, ensuring that it goes equitably out to students. Thank you for that explanation. Um, Speaker Babin with that motion, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Chairperson Hull. Speaker Babin, it is your motion. You have the floor. Um, I would like to uh, yield my time to any questions that people may have about said motion. Are there any questions on the said motion, Representative Kirk? Uh, yeah, so more of a clarification. So you're wanting to um, not take it away, but just real put it in a different area so it's uh, more of an application process to say, hey, I need this, and then go through more of a in-depth application process, and um, so forth and so forth. Like that's pretty much what you're saying, correct? Kind, yeah, pretty much. Um, and then we are also we will also stipulate that they need to come back in the next fiscal year with a new plan for how they are going to better assist students. Uh, and create their program better for WSU students to have their children in their program. Representative Kirk, with the follow up? Yeah, this isn't more of a question. This is a uh, an agreement. I think this is a very good um, motion to go towards, uh, with the um, expectations to see how are they going to be, be bettering um, their area and <clears throat> contr not control, but assist better with. Um, I would like to rescind my motion and make a new one. Uh, so I would like to inste instead make their budget, sorry, I'm going to do the math very quickly, $269,000.91, which should be a cut uh, of uh, 25000 My math could be wrong, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the expert do the math. <laughs> Just to double check me. Yeah, minus 25,000. And we would then pull 25,000 also. So we are cutting their budget by 25,000 straight up. And then we are still going to reserve 25,000 to allocate? No? Then I, can I ask Dr. Hall to <laughs> explain very quickly? Yeah, Dr. Hall, you have the floor. They, they do not have a functioning advisory board. So um, I don't know how we decide how the, that is allocated. You know, one of the things we could do is, is ask student government to work with the, the Child Development Center over the next year to come up with a different funding model for scholarships for students. But to say that there's going to be a group that can allocate $25,000 to students just doesn't exist. Uh, can I answer, respond? 
I was gonna ask a question before that, Dr. Hall. When you say there's not a functioning advisory board, do you mean there is no advisory board at all or is it just not in so action? There has not been an advisory board for 10 to 15 years. So it's my understanding that the advisory board is an SGA function. So we could revive that fairly simply from my understanding, um, but I'll let advisor Fonseca if the chair will allow. Yeah, advisor Fonseca. So yeah, Dr. Hall is correct. The advisory board hasn't existed for many, many years. To be honest, I don't even know why it's still written in our documents, but we've never touched it in there. Um, so the number would remain the same because we would need that 25,000 from somewhere. Right, we're just making note, and I will mention note this in our, in our minutes, that a portion of that will be held to award for the scholarships that we had talked about. Um, and when that board is put together, hopefully it won't, it won't take long, but we'll see how this goes. Um, then, right, then they'll have the, the ability to hopefully look at those dollars, but then con collaboratively between the student government and them through its, our, the advisory board statute that we have, um, work on the pieces that you kind of mentioned from there. So your original motion was correct to allocate the full amount uh, with the stipulation that a portion of the 75,000 sliding scale would, ex would still exist there, um, but we would know to be able to put it somewhere else um, a little bit later. But I would advise you keep the number the same um, and right, understanding that it's gonna take us a second to bring this board back together um, and begin some of that work. So since your um, new motion didn't get a second, I'm gonna assume that the original motion is still in action on the floor yeah so with that being said are there any other statements from the committee for the motion at hand representative Bologna. i just have a quick question for the representative uh was there any discussions before this committee i mean before between sga and the child development center regarding setting up of this number one and number two my question is why are we setting it now without any if there is no discussions then why are we setting it now before we did anything. So, okay. to, do you mind if I answer? Thank you. So, uh, to provide a little more context here on this, um, myself and uh, Senator Hull have been in conversations with the Childhood Development Center trying to find um, better ways to allow for more students to have their children receive childcare, uh, and also better ways to, to lessen the, the financial burden of that on the students who are there. Um, and so through those conversations, we've, we've hit snags. It's been rather difficult um, to do that. So this is, this is a solution that we have talked about here. And I believe that some conversations has gone on with Dr. Hall, who oversees this department, of how we can ensure that we are still giving them the ability to function while they find better ways to do this. Um, and also ensuring that that a, the SGA is taking some of the agency that we have already been given to us through this advisory board, which exists in our statutes, which means this has been approved by the administration of the university, the president, all of that in the past. Um, so we have this ability to oversee the Childhood Development Center that we've never used. So this is us utilizing this um, system that we have so that we can ensure that students are being I don't know, not equitably, but helped through <laughs> to get their children into the CDC uh, and ensuring that we are able to push them harder to, to um, relook at their programs and how they can better help, how better help students. Because currently I believe they have 16 student families, uh, which in my personal opinion is not enough, so. Thank you, Speaker Madden. Representative Balaji with a follow up. So my understanding is you try to have dialogue with them, you hit a snag, so you're trying to force their hand here? Yeah, kind of. That's a little aggressive way to put it, but sort of. This is what stands bad for me. Just because our stocks didn't go forward, we just, and we have this procedural way to force them into doing it, I don't think it's the right way to do or, or, or put an oversight committee. I think we should, tr SGA should go forward and ha try to have dialogue with CDC. And if it still doesn't go, then we should go forward. And I don't think this is the right way to do it. That's not the function of this committee. If the SGA is hitting snacks, SGA should take it with up CDC. 
chairperson Hall. So we have tried to have this dialogue in multiple different ways. Um, I don't want you to look at this oversight committee as a force of hand. We would be working with the CDC. It would not just be SGA by ourselves trying to figure it out. There would be a parent of a child that goes to the CDC on this committee. There would be SGA members. There would also be the executive membership of the CDC there. So it is more than just us forcing their hand. We're trying to work together to find a better way to get more of our students' children in the CDC because the CDC is an amazing opportunity that we want more students to experience. Child care is expensive. The numbers that were thrown out, um, what was it? $100,000 for a toddler to go to the CDC, so it's expensive. What was it? Sorry. 11000 Sorry, my apologies. I was like, children are expensive, so. Um, anywho. <laughs> but this is a way that we can work together with them, and it already exists in our bylaws. So why don't we use the tools that we have in order to make, to find a problem that needs to be fixed? Just a quick point of information. When Chairperson Hull is talking about the committee, it's not SGA members on the committee. It's students that SGA um, appoints to the committee, so not SGA members specifically, just students that SGA appoints. Advisor Fonseca, if you have something to add. I do not want us to get into the semantics of what the student government's job is. This body's job is to determine a number. What student government does is what student government does. We are not, this, we are not gonna spend time deliberating the, what student government's role in this process is. We are just focused on the number, providing the recommendation to the Senate, who would ultimately have to make the decision, who is a student government function, to make that determination from there. I don't want us to deliberate, spend time anymore uh, on a function that the student government does because that's not this committee's job. Um, that is why our vice president sits on this committee and our treasurer who both serve on the executive level who can take that information on and why our speaker of the Senate serves on it as well. We're, I would advise us to move forward and off of the subject of the responsibility of student government because that is not in the purview of this body uh, to, to determine. Um, while I know there are probably questions about it and there's concerns about it or whatnot, um, sorry, I'm doing it again, sorry Mackenzie. While there are probably questions and concerns about it, that is not for this body to determine um, because we can't tell the student government what to do from there. Also, I made a mistake with Olivia's motion, so when we're done with the question, the number is actually $25,000 25, decrease from this, so it will be the 269 that Olivia mentioned earlier. That's my bad. So, again, just wanted to clarify, Let's move on from talking about the, what student government's job is. So just to reiterate, now we will be um, oh, Mackenzie, uh, Vice President Haas, no, Mackenzie. So I guess to clarify, we will be discussing whether or not we will separate out the $25,000 as a scholarship, not necessarily who will determine where that scholarship goes. No, we're yes and no. So the yes to the part of we're looking at subtracting $25,000 from their increase. What student government does on the other part is what the, is what the other piece of it is. So we're just, now the actual the debate should actually be, we're just allocating 269, it's not on there yet, but you're just gonna allocate the 269, which is a $25,000 decrease, and then the rest of it will be for later. Not for this group to decide. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna go into a whole new motion. We're just gonna say that we're talking about $269,091. So everyone's on the same page. All right, so with that motion, um, Representative Balaji. Uh, I'd urge the representative or speaker Olivia to, uh, to consider them, to consider to fund them come fully because again, uh, it's a budget cut of 25,000 is what you're suggesting at this point. And I think we shouldn't be doing that at this point. And I really urge, I mean, since the discussion of the SGA came up, I just want to tell that I really, I mean, I, oversight is necessary, but it, should, it shouldn't be a one-sided one. Like it sh we should, at least you should try to have a conversation, at least let them know that this is coming. So this time I think we should fund them fully and take this up for the next year if it's possible. And I urge all the committee members to think about the same and because right now it's going to look I mean it is going to be a twenty five thousand but the dollars budget cut. 
Anyone else wishing to speak on the motion at hand? Vice President Haas? I think there's a bit of confusion because at this point, we would be giving the money back to students directly to attend the Child Development Center. So maybe not this specific cut, but all in all, I think the reason that the committee came up and the reason that the scholarship came up in the first place is to say that the money will return to students at the end of the day and that this is just a way for us to, to be able to say that this, this money is directly impacting students and to be able to like a, account for that. And it's not necessarily us having oversight over the CDC <coughs> as student government. I think it's more having oversight of the student fee and making sure that it goes directly to the students that it is meant to support. Speaker Bowman. Uh, I think great, great points made by um, Vice President Haas. And I also think that it's, it's important to note that all $25,000 that we are cutting will go back to the Childhood Development Center through students. So like we're giving students money that will directly be spent on the Childhood Development Center then giving them that's $25,000. We're just giving it to them in a different way. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're giving it to them in a different way uh, than through this fee. So we're not really cutting their budget, but it, it will look like a, a cut. Advisor Fonsec. Additionally, right, want to add that there are conversations that are being had. Um, so this isn't, it will not be a surprise. Um, we are in the middle right now of some conversations and some discussions, um, but right, moving forward, this triggers the ability for us to revisit the allocation in which is directed to the Child Development Center. Um, like Speaker Bravin said, and even uh, uh, echoing what uh, Vice President Haas said, of, yes, it, it will look like a cut, because it is. To their base budget, it is. Um, op, you know, you gotta think, I guess, the other piece of it. Operationally, right, the scholarships will only be earmarked for that area should the scholarships go through and be funded and awarded, whatever it is. But this provides us an opportunity to re revisit um, the allocation to this area a little bit more specifically uh, in the impact of student fees being utilized for this space. Um, outside of, of this committee, right, I, I wanna clarify that there are conversations that are being had and it's not to, to at least ease your concern. It is not a surprise. It will not be a surprise should the motion carry, if that helps at all. That being said, in essence of time on this motion, um, I am going to close the debate and we're gonna move into the vote on the um, allocation of $269,091 to the Child Development Center. Um, you may now vote, A is yes, B is now. The vote is eight to zero, the motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. Uh, Madam Clerk, we're ready to proceed. Line item number 28 is Counseling and Testing Center Prevention Services. They requested $374,150 which is $15.59 per student. Their information is located on page 112 of the fee finder. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any motions for the line item? Chairperson Holt. Yes, um, I move that we decrease their funding to 330,150 um, and I can speak on it. So the motion is to decrease to $330,050? $150, sorry. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Second from Speaker Babin. Chairperson Hall, it is your motion, you may speak. Yes, so the way that I got that number was I subtracted $44,000, which is the additional cost of the um, therapist that works part-time for athletics and part-time um, for the general student body. 
So the reason why I came up with that was because students give um, the athletic department $4 million a year. So I'm pretty sure that they could find the 44,000 to fully fund this um, therapist. Um, and this was an initiative started through athletics. So I personally think that athletics should pay for it. So. Um, I'm gonna recognize myself to speak. Piggybacking off of that, I do think that um, with the initiative started by athletics, it is a great initiative, but I think it should be funded through athletics as well, because um, its primary goal was to help out the athletic students. Um, so after that, it's gone. Um, anyone else wishing to speak? Dr. Hall, yeah. I'm sorry, you told me I could speak and that's all I do, I apologize. I'd like to point out that Dr. Provines mentioned that the position, 60% um, of the people she's seeing are not athletes. So, so the 50% that's coming from athletics is more than covering the amount of time that person is spending, spending with athletes. She's seeking the money to support the, the other half of the position that's, that's working with general students. Just wanted to point it out. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Anyone else wishing to speak? On the motion, Representative Balazi. Uh, just a quick question. Will this take away any, I mean, will if we do take away this position from uh, the department, I mean, from the counseling services, do we have other counselors? I'm sorry, I'm not up to date on that. So, one, we can't specifically take away specific money for specific positions in line items. So, just by the subtraction does not mean we're getting rid of any position or giving the burden to someone else, they could move money around to suffice um, to position if they need to. Um, so just because we did subtract that specific amount does not mean we're move removing that position, just to make that clear. We can't make um, specific changes to line items. With a point of information to answer his question. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are other counselors uh, and master's students that perform services in the, in CAPS. So this is an extra added on position that, that they have very recently hired. Representative Moika. Uh, point of inquiry, what was the number that was subtracted again? I can do it. <laughs> $44,000, which is the number that Dr. Provines gave us when we were going through it. Dr. Hall. You can't compel the athletic department to pay for something. So by saying this, you're, and if they don't have money in reserves, that means this person is not gonna have a job anymore. That's what you're saying. Chairperson Hall. I personally don't think it's fair um, when a person gets hired that student fees now has to make up the money for that. Um, this position was not brought to us beforehand, it was just hired. I personally do not think it's fair to put on this committee that somebody gets fired. Because at the end of the day, we just, we just allocate money and they decide what to do with it. So at the end of the day, I don't personally think it's fair that we are the ones at the end of the day who decide who gets hired and fired. That is the responsibility of the department. And also just wanna reiterate, just because we're taking a specific amount away does not mean um, that this position is going away. If they would like to, they can move money around to still fund it, um, yeah. Dr. Hall. But you're taking away a specific amount that was mentioned to you for that, that half of that position. So that, that the argument you just made doesn't really hold true because you're, you're taking a specific amount away. If you, it would be different if you said, we're gonna reduce their budget by $30,000 because we're trying to save money. But in particular, you're taking a, 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 a specific amount connected to one position away. Correct, but like I said before, the office and department can still do whatever they want with the money. That's what I'm getting at. Um, anyone else wish to speak on the line item? Um, Representative Balaji, also Dr. Hall, if we can get you to mute your mic, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just worried that if, if they do decide to hold on this position, they're going to cut away other services or from other heads. Now, I do see that they do have some uh, reserves, but I don't know, like they, they have mar earmarked it for some incidentals, which may be a possibility for this department. So. I want us to, I, I urge the committee members to think about this really long to make sure that they are making the right decision. I understand that we are just reducing a dollar amount, but we are indirectly targeting that. I mean, if, and, if, and if it does backfire and if they do hold on to that position, that means other services are going to go away or get underfunded. 
So yeah, uh, we really have to think about this before we make a decision on the vote. So I urge you to think about it a little bit. I do, I, that's, a, that, that's all from my end. Anyone else wishing to speak on this line item, Speaker Babin? I think that it's important to note that we are still giving them an increase from fiscal year 21. Um, so they are still getting a lot of the things that, that they have asked for and that they have requested. Um, so we are not cutting their budget from what they had before. We are just cutting their request for this year for new things. Um, so they are still going to be able to do new things and new programs with the money that, that we give them. Um, we would just with this, with this reduction of $44,000 say that, um, you know, yeah, I'm trying to think of how to word this, but that we, <sighs> yeah, that I, I'm going to stick with what I said. We're doing something and, and the correct way to word it is, is not in my brain right now. But basically, I want to point out that, that we are still giving them an increase from the year before. Representative Pelosi. By cutting them, we are just giving them a raise for $400 or 400 odd because it was 329 819 last time, 330 150 this time. It's like 400 500 bucks. I mean, that's not even a, uh, you know, inflation rate. <laughs> Representative Kirk. That might be true, but they're still able to, that right now they're able to operate on that. And they, they have been helping other students. It might be four or $500, but it's like, that does not change what Speaker Babin said. It is still a raise. It is still an increase. It could even be an increase of a dollar. It's still an increase. This is an increase of four or $500. So um, going back to what was said, we are not cutting them anything. We are just saying that we um, don't see that we are going to be giving them the increase that they are wanting right now. Representative Bellagio. Just, um, I just want to reiterate, you are, you are, we are assuming that they are going to take away this position. My point is, we are not assured, we cannot make them do that. They are still losing, they are losing $44,000 and if they don't take away that position as we expect them to or as we assume to, then it's going to affect the rest of their budget. I mean, they're going to take it either from their reserves or through which I think it is funded this time, if my, if my memory serves right, or if not, I'm wrong, I'm sorry about that. But my point is, like, uh, we, are, we are thinking this would happen, but it may not happen. I'm just trying to get that across, is that if that doesn't happen, then we are looking at slashing, underfunding their other projects or other heads. Just to reiterate, we are not taking away any position. We do not have the authority to do that. Um, cutting money does not mean cutting position. We cannot do that as a student fees committee. We cannot tell people how to spend their money. We can only give them certain amounts of money. Representative Martin. Yeah, I... This is a very big decision, especially for me. I struggle with um, you know, the two sides of this discussion. Um, as somebody who heavily, a lot of emphasis on heavily, uses this service, um, and this service being the reason that I am still enrolled at WSU, it is extremely important to me, and I understand that this issue um, does hold some weight. Um, but I do agree. Um, to clarify again, um, that we are not forcing them to fire anybody. Um, we're not telling them how to spend this money. It is a big cut and it hurts that we do have to make cuts. If it were up to me, we wouldn't make any cuts, but unfortunately we have a number and we have a goal that we need to work with. Um, you know, there are a lot of solutions to this problem, but none of which this specific committee can handle because we cannot tell them how to spend their money. We are taking away that specific number, but what they do with this budget cut is up to them entirely. Um, so I'm gonna have to say that I agree with this as much as I don't want to cut what they're asking for. I feel like we need to. Thank you, Senator Representative Martin, Speaker Bowden. I just want to just kind of point out some, some things in, in the history of their budget. 
um, specifically that from fiscal year 20's budget, with this, what we the number we have is an increase of $96,885. They are providing incredible services to this university and have been receiving huge chunks of money to continue to provide these services. And I think that while this is a fairly significant cut to their, their overall request, because I don't want to say their budget because they've been operating on, on a lower budget in the past, this is just a cut to, to their request um, for something new. Um, I think that it, it is viable and okay for us to make a cut like this, understanding that we gave them a lot of money for new services last year. Um, that are great and are doing incredible things for this university. Anyone else wishing to speak? Dr. Hall? I just did the math in that um, of their budget, 96% of their budget is all in personnel. So it's, there, there isn't a lot of money to reallocate to something else if, if there's not funding for this position. So I'm just, I, I'm not, I just, and I also just want to point out that health and, the Health and Wellness Committee voted to support this, this, um, this proposal as well. So a subcommittee of this body has already said that we, we support this initiative. So I don't, I just want to make sure we don't forget that. Point of clarification, a subcommittee of the Student Government Association, not of the student fees process. Thank you, Speaker Levin. Anyone else wishes to speak on the motion at this moment? Vice President Haas. I will say that the emphasis is there for a reason. I think, yes, we are not exactly targeting this specific position. At the same time, it is a plea that departments do not hire and then ask for the funding after the fact, and a plea that um, athletics can potentially help out with this. The, the, all of those things have been stated. Additionally, there is an emphasis on our campus that needs to be held for mental health, and I think that's a really important, important thing that we need to take into consideration. At the same time, this funding would not be utilized to hire four more counselors or additional counselors. It would be used to fill the, the one position that has already been hired, and not that $44,000 would be able to hire four more counselors, but at the same time, I think the emphasis is to pay for half a position that athletics could pay for. And that's not, it's not necessarily our job to consider what is the most important or where this money comes from at the end of the day. It's what we want to see happening within CAPS and moving forward. Um, and as Speaker Robin has stated, it is a cut from the request, and and maybe that maybe this is too drastic of a cut. Maybe we can make it twenty thousand or something like that, because the point has already been made. Because us saying forty four thousand is to make that point. It's on the YouTube live. Everybody can see it now. We understand that this is a battle that we, you know, want to fight as the committee. But if twenty thousand dollars would go towards would go better towards CAPS, then maybe that's what we should go for. But that's also a conversation that can be had. With that being said, we do have five minutes left on this line item. Um, just, just keep that in mind. Chairperson Hall. Um, I would like to retract my motion with another motion. So I will allow you to retract your motion without any vote. You can make a new motion. You do have five minutes, just to remind you. Um, I will allow the cut to uh, increase or technically decrease to $22,000. Thanks. Is there a second? Second. Second from Speaker Babin. Chairperson Hall, is your motion? You have the floor. Vice President Haas made um, a good point, and I think there is a happy medium. Again, while we cannot tell them how to spend their money, at the end of the day, it is their choice. So I think we can come to a middle place where they can find um, wiggle room, and then at the end of the day, still advocate for offices not to hire before asking for money. 
um, and while also maybe even advocating that athletics plays a little more into certain positions that they initiated the conversation with. Thank you for that, Chairperson Halls. Anyone else wishing to speak on this motion? Representative Balaji. Uh, just a quick note, uh, as, as Dr. Hall mentioned, 96% uh, of their money is going towards personal. Uh, as much as uh, we are cutting 22,000, which I don't know where is it going to come from for them, uh, which means there is going to be a pay cut or a loss of job, student job most probably. Uh, and, 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 and I just want the committee to know that that is going to be a probable thing that's going to happen. As much as we are trying to make a point, and I might even vote for this, I'm thinking in my, keeping in mind that they do have some reserves, but there is a chance that we are losing a student job out of this point making. Vice President Haas. Yeah, I'd just like to make a delineation that that 96% of their budget is the $329,819, correct? Um, I looked at their total budget as 514 and then that 494 goes toward personnel. And so that's just part of that overall number. I was on page, I was on their counseling services budget. Page on 120. One, on page 120. Sorry. Just FYI, we do have two minutes left. Speaker Babin. I'll make it quick. I think that this is a good compromise for us to make, um, making the clear point that we wanted to make that, that it is, it does not feel appropriate for entities to hire positions that they don't have funding for to then ask for an increase, forcing us to, to feel the pressure of them potentially needing to fire someone if we don't, um, approve that increase. So I think that this 22,000 is, is a good happy medium for us to hit. Um, and still meet our budget cons to, to still meet our budget concerns that we have uh, with the overall budget. Uh, and yeah, thank you. Dr. Hall. Point has been made. I have heard you loud and clear. We won't do it again. That being said, if there are no objections, I will move straight into the voting period. A is for yes to um, allocate $352,150. B is no. I voted eight to zero, the motion carries. I also have some, if you would let me, I have a recommendation for the committee moving forward, when, if that's okay. Um, I would advise that we skip to prevent, prevention services program since it's a part of the same department. Um, so moving to line 30 instead of 29, and then I would recommend we adjourn for the day. I will allow that. Um, so as Advisor Fonseca said, we're moving to line 30, I'm sorry, line 30. Um, and then after we are done with this, we will be adjourning. So we do have just, a f we don't have a, the full 30 minutes we would get, but just please keep your eye on the time. So um, Madam Clerk. Line item number 30 is the prevention services program they requested $28,804, which is $1.20 per student. Their information is found on page 147 of the feed binder. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there a motion on the line item? Speaker Babin. Uh, I move to adopt this budget as it has been presented at twenty eight thousand dollars eight hundred or twenty eight thousand twenty eight eight hundred and four thousand dollars thank you is there a second second seconded by representative kirk uh speaker babbitt it is your motion you have the floor um so i think that this is one of the the best programs that i've seen at this university it was part of the reason that um i decided to attend WSU was when I saw one of their presentations at um, some event that I went to as a, a, a probably a junior in high school. And I think that the work that they have done to destigmatize um, mental health services on campus has been incredible. They provide great trainings. 
uh, and I really think that they should receive their full budget. Thank you, Speaker Babin. Anyone else wish to speak on this line item? That being said, we will move into the voting period. Um, we'll be voting on allocating the twenty-eight, the full twenty-eight thousand eight hundred and four dollars to prevention services program. I voted eight to zero. The motion carries. Thank you, Advisor Fonseca. As stated previously, we will not be hearing any more. We will not be deliberating anymore today. Um, so we'll begin with closing. Uh, Madam Clerk. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to committee regulations as set by the bylaws, the committee shall provide an opportunity for public forum at the end of each day of hearings. Advisor Fonseca, has anyone requested to speak during public forum? Uh, no. All right. Seeing none, the committee will be in recess until what time? 8.30 tomorrow morning. We are in recess. Please leave.